five, four, three, two, one. They've landed. You're in the right place. Place. Online, on the web, and on air. All over the world. Talk radio. You hear us, we hear you. Yeah, good evening everybody and welcome back to the KTPF Community Talk Show. KTPF, we're keeping the paranormal friendly here every Sunday at half past eight. And uh, um, even though I get shouted at by Andy, it's already half past eight. <laughs> so um, I hope you've had a good week. We have. It's um, We had a great Halloween. We've had a great weekend. And uh, a busy one as well, haven't we, Steve? Uh, just a wee bit. Yeah, just a wee bit. But more about that in a moment. Um, just to let you know that uh, whatever happens tonight, whatever we talk about, you must remember, okay, that um, even though our intentions are to provide our listeners with different views and outlooks promoting discussion, and um, although we assume no responsibility of the opinions and beliefs expressed by our guest callers, listeners, or chatters on the KTPF Community Talk Show, the opinions expressed are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. Okay, so uh, don't forget, we don't want no uh, anything obscene in sexual nature, racist, personally offensive, or otherwise inappropriate will be unaccepted. And if you... Uh, if you post such comments, we will have to remove you, okay? So um, just thought I'd let you know. But uh, as I say, we hope for a nice evening tonight. We have three people on tonight, okay? We have um, a, a man coming on at 9 o'clock by the name of Alien Bill. That's what they call him, okay? So we'll be talking to him at 9 o'clock. And, uh, and then later on at 10 o'clock, We'll be talking to um, a young man by the name of uh, Dr. Peter McHugh, okay, which uh, sounds a very interesting man. And um, uh, we'll be talking to him about such things. Um, I'm going to have to open my emails up so I can see what the hell we're going to talk about because uh, hopefully you won't hear we've got mail because I haven't got my speaker in. But uh, anyway, uh, just to, um, before we start, just to let you know, live in the hub tonight, we have a young man with us um, by the name of David Tate. He's going to be talking to us throughout the show um, about what's been happening um, in his area and uh, more on what we were talking about last week that I couldn't tell you about, but we said we'd talk about it tonight. Good evening, David. Good evening. <laughs> How are you? Uh, very well. Long weekend. Yes. Uh, slightly tired. Many events. Many events. We'll uh, we'll find out more about that in a moment. Excellent. Okay. Um. So before we go any further, we must, 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 as we normally do, acknowledge those people that are in the chat room, and uh, say a big hello to Poppy. Poppy's been there from the beginning. We've also got um, Minnesota PIG, which uh, is Anita. I'm assuming will be there somewhere, and John Savage, um, from Minnesota, dear old Doc, um, and. Uh, who else have we got in there, Steve? Uh, we have uh, Reggie Debs has popped, it, popped in, and, uh, and I'm sure Lee's in the background there somewhere. Yeah. And uh, Andy 707, as usual. Oh, well, that's good. And I'm sure we'll get a few people coming in and uh, uh, speaking to us um, in the chat room as normal. Um, we normally find that we've also got listeners out there, because uh, nine times out of ten, there's more people listening, uh, or rather more viewers, than there are in the chat room. Don't, have you noticed that, Steve? Uh, quite often. Yeah, so if you are out there listening, okay, please do feel free to uh, pop in and uh, join in the chat on the um, in the chat room. And uh, later on, if you wish, um, you can always give us a call uh, on 0844 414 3982 and speak to our guests that we have here. Uh, we have two guests that will be on Skype um, at both 9 and 10 o'clock, and also we have David Tate here, and I'm sure he'll be willing to answer any questions um, that you might have for us. And uh, um, we want you to get involved, so don't forget, uh, we need you to get involved. Uh, one thing I will tell you about is um, we are moving. It is official. It is. <laughs> at last. Um, yes. But uh, I'm expecting it to be in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, we just have to get uh, get, get a door fixed. Yep. So and then, uh, uh, and then it's uh, 
sort out the paperwork. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, to be honest with you. Um, I'm hoping that um, the likes of BT and everybody will um, uh, work with us and get us up and running so that we don't miss any shows. Um, and I'm hoping if, that if we do miss any shows, really and truthfully, I'm hoping it's not going to be the 17th of November when we do the cage live. But uh, if it does happen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a word with um, John Blackburn and uh, speak to him and say, if push comes to shove, I'm going to just tell him to do what he's planned to do and just broadcast. Carry, carry on without us. You know, and carry on without us. You can still come in and speak to him because he will have people there uh, watching the chat room and finding out what's going on. Okay. Now, um, uh, talking about John Blackburn, we was at uh, Drake Low Tunnels last night, weren't we, Steve? Oh, yes. And uh, basically, uh, we managed to do our 20 minute vigil. And uh, we, we raised a little bit, Easy. not a lot. We raised, raised a little bit. I think we raised £25. Keep um, in mind, the, web, the site is still open. You can still yeah, donate. You can still donate. Very worthy cause. But also, it is, um, uh, I think we spent more than that in petrol getting down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, um, the site is still up there. And uh, you can donate to Blesma, which is just giving. Um, Dot com. Let me just find the uh, thing again. Justgiving.com forward slash Suzanne hyphen Taggart one. So uh, you'll be able to uh, donate there. And um, so we put in a bit ourselves just to make it up a bit, to be honest with you, because it did look a bit poultry at first. But saying that, it is all part and parcel to the uh, event that's happening at the cage. So whatever we got last night will be also contributing to that as well. So um, in John's side of the uh, fundraising. So no, we're not coming to the cage, I'm afraid. Uh, unfortunately Andy. not. No. So we're not coming to the cage. Well, we're well hopefully, if, if the internet is everything's up, we'll be, we'll be still doing the show at the same time as you're doing that. Yeah, we'll the, ba the basic idea battles and forwards. is uh, John's hoping to be broadcasting from R plus 4 so that people can see what he's doing. And then we start the show at half past eight. And then it's the cage night, basically. We'll be doing what we normally do in the chat room, you know, and in the, in the, uh, um, in the hub, you know, talking amongst ourselves about everything else, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then dropping back to John and talking to him and seeing how things are going. And, and you lot there have got to be asked, saying, where do you want him to go next, you know, and all this, that and the other. Andy, you've been doing a past life regression on John. Yes, so... Uh, Sorry, have... you didn't hear that? Past life regression? Yeah, Andy, so, uh, <laughs> so that will all be shown live. So, um, as I say, um, that's what we're hoping for, okay? Um, but as I say, I'm hoping that um, the BT will work with us and get everything done for us um, in, in time. So... Because it could be that by the end of the week, we could get the go-ahead and we want to move out as quick as possible, don't we, Steve? Yes, indeed. So, but... Uh, get ourselves settled in and then uh, yes. get the office sorted. Mm -hmm. And then one room at a time. Yeah. Now, going back to um, last week, on Wednesday, um, we was invited by David, who's here with us today. Um, they've been uh, doing a, a commemorative... Um, uh, thing for thing. You yeah, tell her, Dave. Yeah, but you tell her. What was your What was your actual plan? What was the plan for the weekend? Uh, the plan really uh, was to reinvestigate or reopen the Gorse Hall murder, uh, which happened in 1909, the first of November 1909. Yeah. Um, while we were doing it, we've uncovered quite a lot of witness statements, evidence, personal photographs. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of it has been interest to the town of Staley Bridge, where yeah. I come from. I'm from staleybridgetown.com, which is uh, where the investigation was taking place. And during some of the conversations on the threads, we were asked, had there ever been a paranormal investigation? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't find records of one. It turns out there was one a while ago. Um, and I thought it was an ideal opportunity to carry one out. That's why I got in touch with you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're residents in Tameside, uh -huh. and I thought we'd go and have a look. And so that's what we did. When he talks about us guys, he's on about outside of UK shadow seekers, not the KTPF. 
Because <laughs> um, oh, so, we are UK Shadow Seekers Paranormal Group. Um, the KTPF is a side thing that we do due to the fact that uh, there has been a lot of animosity through the paranormal um, group side. And uh, we're just trying to have uh, a little bit of uh, friendliness out there somewhere that um, people can have and uh, talk about and share and um, in experiences and stuff like that. And we've been going since 2007 uh, uh, as UK Shadow Seekers and uh, KTPF started about six months later, didn't it, Steve? It did indeed. So, so hopefully, um, as I say, that's what the KTPF is all about. And uh, we've been uh, very KT... We're, we're proud to be KTPF, as we say, don't we, Steve? So uh, you you had this um, uh, thing on, t on, on s Saturday as well that... We With did, yeah. We, uh, we have a group called the Friends of Gorse Hall. Mm -hmm. The Gorse Hall estate and the house itself uh, was torn down in 1910. But the grounds, as it was passed down to the families, it was stated it had to be green land. Yeah. Uh, so it's never been developed on. And the Friends of Gorse Hall have uncovered all the foundations, etc. Uh, and the 104-year unsolved murder of George Harry Storrs has always been fascination in the town not just in the town nationally as well we've had yeah uh, edward woodward doing I th uh, what was he called in suspicious in suspicious yeah. circumstances yeah uh, he did an episode of that on gorse hall mm -hmm. and julian fellows investigates they did a program mm. up there and the there's also a book is that there called the stabbing there is of there's a book called the stabbing of george harry stores uh, yeah. which very accurately in a lot of cases plots out the story of the mm. Gorse Hall murder. Um, a lot of the opinions in it are subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone has their own opinion. And yeah. the police couldn't solve it over 100 years ago. So we're going to struggle now. Right. Uh, well, we'll find out more about the story of it a little bit later. Fantastic, okay. Yeah. But as I say, um, this has been a, a subject that's been you've been passionate about for years, hasn't it? Well, I actually went to Gorse Hall School. Uh, and when I was 10, so we're going back to, what, 1982, mm -hmm. I did a study in school on the Gorse Hall murder, and it captured my imagination from there, and it's something I've always dipped back into, if you like, yeah. and working with stadigristown.com gave me the opportunity to get a lot of people to investigate it all at the same time. Yeah. And with the Friends of Gorse Hall, with all the evidence they've uncovered, we've now got a little mobile museum that they brought around, mm -hmm. and it's inspired another generation. We now have, uh, there was a young girl on the walk, I think she's 10 years old, and she'd done a study about three years ago yeah. in school as well, and it captured her imagination. She came with a folder on the walk. Oh, uh, she yes. took notes. She has her own opinion on who the actual murderer was, and I spoke to her, and it is actually very viable. Yeah. Uh, and if we're coming back to it later. Yeah. She has similar opinions to some people that we met on Friday night as well. Oh. So, so ten it was year old. It is, yeah. And ten years of age, really getting into the subject. The good thing was to see how many families mm. actually came on the walk. There was children of all ages. Uh, we had one group of seven people with three generations mm. who came on the walk all together, and to see that in the community spirit that's in Staley Bridge is, is fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's good, that's good. We're going to find out a bit more about this murder a bit later on, and we're also going to talk about what happened on our initial um, visit on Wednesday. Yes. That was quite interesting, and also what happened on the actual investigation on Friday night. Yes. Which was even more interesting. Um, it actually made Wednesday, Friday night made Wednesday more interesting, that's it. Yes, yes. So uh, we're, we're going to keep you in suspenders, as I like to say, about that, and... Uh, um, as I say, Dave's going to be with us all night, um, and uh, he's also going to be there on hand to maybe ask um, any questions um, to our guests. Who he might, you know, he might pique his interest and ask questions there. We want you to ask questions as well. And um, we've now got Tigger in. Uh, that's Andy who's spoken to you. Oh, so Andy. you know, um, and there's a little bit about him that's uh, part of this as well, isn't there? Yes, and he's done some of his own investigations as well into the background of the Gorse Hall murder that I really appreciate. Yes. And has put me on to a couple of things since Friday night. Okay, well, we'll find out a bit more about this. It's really interesting, guys. Um, I didn't know about the story of Gorse Hall. I had heard it was there, and I, ha I had a little knowledge of it, but um, 
uh, apart from that, um, I don't know anything about the history or anything like that. Um, I've been lent the book that I can now look at to uh, see what's going on. But uh, apart from that, I don't didn't know nothing at all about Gorse Hall. Um, but it, so it was really interesting for me. But as I say, we'll come back to that later. T Andy says, I'm in the right place. I heard someone say something about suspenders. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> okay. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to hand over to Steve because you've got some observations for us, I, haven't I, you? I have a few. Yes. Oh, good. As usual, he has a few. So uh, over to Steve for the observations. Okay, then. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll give a big thank you to About.com and The Express for tonight's uh, observations. Uh, the first okay. of all is uh, how to see a ghost. Mm -hmm. Hearing what might be a ghost voice isn't good enough for you. You actually want to see one. The internet just might make that possible. Many webcams have been set up in haunted locations around the world where ghosts have previously been seen. All you have to do is open up a web page and watch. Okay. Now, here on the web, here is a... Hang on, let's get my button so I don't go too far down. Here is a selection of currently live ghost webcams. Uh, the BBC has set up a ghost cam at... Uh, oh, here we go. Clancy Ash Fira Manor in Wales. Hey, the big words are back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, picture updates every five minutes. You can also see a gallery of captured images uh, that some viewers believe show evidence of something. Uh, also, Hall Online offers live streaming video uh, with their ghost cam. Uh, we, we actually know this one, don't we, Sue? Yeah. We actually know the also Hall one. There's a, a, a little girl with red hair that's quite often seen on that ghost cam. By all accounts, uh, it's reputed to be haunted by the White Lady, mm -hmm. who has been seen by many locals. Uh, she may have been Queen Elizabeth's favourite maid of honour. Uh, Jane Houston at, uh, at Ghost Watcher has set up no fewer than 31 webcams around her home, uh, designed, she says, to help her sleep better at night, because the strange sounds she's she's heard surrounding her. You can even submit your comments and. See if any suspicious activity. And she's having 31 webcams in your house. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> it's a <laughs> really, really big brother. Uh, Haunted Valley webcam looks out over skies of Longendale in Derbyshire. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, apart from UFO, there's a, a bomber that crashed there a long time ago. Yes. And it's uh, heard and sometimes the lights are seen from time to time. Uh, the lights have been seen as well as UFOs and other strange phenomena. The camera s sends live streaming video for 16 hours a day. It shot up, shut off overnight. Have you got the websites for these? I haven't. They, it, uh, I just they just put these up. They didn't actually put the websites up. Right. Okay. But uh, I'm sure they'd be quite easy to find. Right. Uh, I will post this list in the uh, KTBF page. Okay. Later. Uh, Ghostwatch at islandeye.com, now there's one for you, mm -hmm. uh, has their webcam focused on the room of a linen mill in the island where the ghost of Helena Blunden is said to roam. She died there in tragic fall in 1912. There was even an eerie recording of Helena singing captured on a wax cylinder shortly before her death. Lexington Ghost Cam, mm -hmm. about the USS Lexington aircraft carrier, hopes to catch sight of a ghost, uh, a sailor in his summer white uniform. Uh, the ghost who walks with a limp has been seen in the engine room and has even talked to tourists. Okay. Now that's one cheeky ghost. Very. He's definitely not hiding, is he? Uh, the parking lot ghost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is he here to take your ticket? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, was captured on tape, not by a webcam, but a security camera. Uh, you, if you bring this one up online, you can play the video, and you just might see a shadowy ghost move across the back wall of the garage. Mm. I have actually seen that one. It's uh, my p personal opinion is it could be anybody walking past. Okay. But there you go. Uh, ghost Legends of the Queen Mary has his, has his webcam trained on the ship's pool, uh, which many psychics say is the centre of the liner's ghostly activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Willard Library in uh, Evansville, Indiana, has a ghost too. There is known as a grey lady. Uh, two webcams have been set up to try and catch her. 
uh, one in the research room and one in the child's room. Uh, the lost meaning of Halloween is next, you guys. Okay. Uh, this, this, this was done by uh, Christian Hummel. Hang on. Before you go into that, can I just say, uh, I do have problems with my Firefox every now and again. For some reason, it just crashes on me. So, whatever happens, if you lose us, don't worry, we will be back. And also, um, if you have problems, just refresh the screen, okay? Because it could be down to live stream as well. Okay, sorry, Sue. Well, thank you. I meant to have said that earlier. Oh, okay, okay. Well, as Eve, or Halloween, or Halloween, uh, Day of the Dead, Samhain, or whatever name it, it has been called, this special night preceding All Hallows Day, November the 1st, has been considered for centuries as one of the most magical nights of the year. Uh, a night of power when the veil that separates our world from the other world is at its thinnest. Mm -hmm. uh, as ubiquitous as Halloween celebrations are throughout the world, few of us that know the true, true origin, getting tongue tied again, of Halloween in the ceremony of honouring our ancestors and the Day of the Dead. A time when the veils between the worlds are thinner and so many could see the other side of life. Uh, that was I, last week. I know, but it, I didn't have it last week. Okay. <laughs> see. So, but uh, basically what I'm trying to say here is, is maybe we should forget the candy. Yeah. And... Uh, and then that, and actually think about what it's actually actually mean, and because uh, Mexico they celebrated, didn't they? Mex in in Mexico, I can't remember what they call it, but they actually do, uh, have a picnic in in the uh, in the graveyard in the graveyard yeah. with, with the graves and everything of of their ancestors. Not so Wayne, not Sam Hain, so Wayne, so Wayne. Yep. It's spelt with a H here. I know. So next, Sa Sam Hain. It says there. It does. Okay. Wasn't that a group? Well, Sam Hain. Sam Hain. Oh no, that's Marshall Hain. Sorry. Oh dear. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking, oh, my mind went back. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I, I mean, from the Halloween thing, it goes right back to the council before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the, there, are, there are so many names of it. It's unbelievable. Uh, Jack O' Lanterns. Oh yeah, old Jack O' Lantern. Uh, has that got something to do with Spring Hill Jack or something? Uh, no. All right. That's something completely different. Okay. Uh, out of ancient traditions comes one of our most famous icons of the holiday uh, of Halloween, uh, the jack-o'-lantern, originating from Irish folklore. The jack-o'-lantern was used to light the lost soul of Jack, a notorious trickster between worlds. All right. Uh, Jack is said to have tricked the devil into a, into a tree, mm. and by carving an image of a cross on the tree trunk, he trapped the devil there. His pranks denied him access to heaven, and angered the devil also, so he couldn't go to hell. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jack was was a lost soul trapped between worlds. As a consolation, the devil gave him a soul ember to light his way through the darkness between the worlds. Well, there you go then. In other words, the jack o' lantern, which originally was in the turnip. Turnip, yeah, Turnip. I heard that, and and not the uh, the pumpkin that we now have, which is uh, come f come from the US. Turnip, Turnip Ed. Yes, no, not Turnip Ed. <laughs> is it? Is, isn't that something to do with a horror film or something? No, I think that was something to do with an MP or somewhere or another. No, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we said earlier, many countries have have these things. Uh, Here's a little story by uh, Stephen Wagner from about.com. Uh, real vampires. Right. Uh, people fantasize about being a vampire, but far from being the attractive, charming, sexually seductive character of popular books and movies and TV shows, the real people who attacked and killed to get their fix of human blood to drink create true horror and terror. They had no supernatural powers, yet seemed to be guided by some inhuman, unnatural force that drove them to carve, crave blood and kill. Possessed and ruled by some unfathomable mental illness, they became serial killers and infamous in the annals of crime. And uh, here are two such uh, vampires. The Vampire of Hanover, uh, yeah. born in October 1879 in Hanover, Germany, Fritz Harman, grew up to earn the dubious nickname of the Vampire of, of Hanover due to his many gruesome and bloody crimes. After serving in the army as a young man, he was arrested for child molestation 
and placed in a mental institution. When he escaped the asylum and fled to Switzerland, where his criminal activity deepened and worsened. At first he lived on the streets committing small crimes to survive. He managed to get hired by the police force as an informer. And it seems it was this position of privilege that emboldened him to uh, do his crimes. He would pick up men off the street, invite them to his home and kill them. Uh, the early 1920s began with a vampire phrase in which he would sink his teeth into the throats of his victims and drink their blood. When the remains of some of his victims were found by police, the trail led to Harmon, and when his residence was investigated, they found 20 corpses. Uh, during his subsequent trial, uh, Harmon faced charges of murdering 24 people, but many believed he was responsible for more than 50. Uh, his trial testimony shocked the public, confessing that he sometimes ate parts of his victims, and when he was employed as a butcher, sold meat of his victims to un customers. It's, um, it's amazing how some of these old stories actually become fant uh, fantasy becomes fiction. It is. You know, uh, there, there was um, that business with uh, Hannibal Lecter um, with the guy that was um, taking women and fattening them up and to use their you know, bodies as part of a like a costume. That was real, wasn't it? Uh, I couldn't well, comment well, on that, but you do get a lot of Chinese whispers on it. Yeah. Well, well, what he was supposed to have done is uh, he softened the skin and yeah. make it, it easier to peel. And yeah. Yes. There was so and that was the idea of it. There were so many. I've, I've heard since that it was all based loosely on true stories. So, you know. Um, Reiki Dev said that her granddad used to get, get her and her sister or brother, either way, turnips um, or sea, uh, sugar beets. Um, kept them qu quiet for hours, carving them out. <laughs> so, uh, and I've just been reminded that it was Graham Taylor who was a turnip head. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I think Dave's just realised that uh, he's sitting in a room with Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, no, I haven't, I haven't now. <laughs> you have now. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the, the other great vampire was uh, the Vampire of London. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, obviously, uh, t t they're trying to find in Highgate Cemetery. Yeah. Uh, born in the strict fundamentalist Christian seat of England, John George Hay, uh, as a youth became wit obsessed with the image of the crucified Christ and the saving power of his blood, which is why he used to drink it. Oh. In the 1940s, he began to have visions, dreams, and revelations, the first of which was to drink his own urine. Another dream convinced him that he needed to drink human blood to maintain his vitality. To fill this driving need, he constructed a laboratory in his home to which he would lure his victims, kill them, drain their blood from their bodies, and dissolve their bodies, bodies in a tub of sulfuric acid, the blood he would drink. Uh, when he tried to sell uh, a fur coat of his elderly victims, he was finally arrested. His attempts to dispose of his victims' bodies did not work entirely. Police investigators found body parts, including incriminating teeth, in his lab. Uh, he was convicted of nine murders, and despite his claims at his trial that they were religious acts and that he needed to drink the blood to obtain eternal life, he was executed by hanging in August 1949. Oh, right. Yet women still find vampires sexy. They yeah. do find vampires sexy. They do. Right, well, it's nine o'clock. I'm going to have to stop you there, my love. Okay, I have some more for later. Yes. And uh, just a quick one. Uh, do you know if we're doing anything Thursday, by the way? This Thursday? Yeah. Uh, can you just double check for me, please? Because uh, we've been asked if we can p bring it forward. <coughs> for the uh, appointment we've got on uh, Friday. <laughs> so, because she's got to go to London, I've got to go and have a look at a new venue on Friday. So, uh, I have nothing to okay, right. Um, what we're going to do now, we're going to contact um, our first guest. He's known as Alien Bill, okay, and um, uh, duh, 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 duh. but uh, just to uh, give you a bit about him, um, which he can do himself. Um, let me see. Uh, he's 59 years old and he's been married for 41 years to Victoria. Um, 
he has four children, three boys and a girl. And um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, what else? Uh, my paranormal and cosmic connections go back to my childhood, and I've always seen strange lights around me. I'm at present writing a book on my paranormal and cosmic connection, which will be out next year. This book will have a hundred or so of my pictures in it that I have been taking for a number of years. He has around 48,000, which he showed Malcolm Robinson, who's been on the show before, uh, a few hundred of them, and uh, over five hours, and he was stunned. Um, I love nature, he says, and countryside, and go fishing when I can. <laughs> um, when at night I fished with some of my friends, something always turns out in the sky and worries my friends, but it has stopped them th taking the mickey. Okay, so uh, we're going to get um, Bill on the on the Skype. Who has? Who has what? <laughs> so, uh, and uh, we'll see what he has to say for himself. Um, okay, so uh, we'll give him a call. So if you'd like to bear with us. Oh, dear. Be glad we moved and I can put this in a proper place. If we have any problems, we have got a landline. So, uh, just in case. Oh, hello. It's gone off. We'll try again. We said nine. I don't think he's used to Skype. Hello. Hi, Sue. Hiya. <laughs> I clicked the wrong one. <laughs> I gathered that. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> right, okay. We're live on air. Okay, Bill. And um, uh, it's not Channel 4, but don't swear. <laughs> I will be swearing. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. Are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, we've got my husband here with me. That's Steve. And we have a guest in also in the, uh, in the hub with us, David. So, um... Basically, uh, do you just want to say hello, uh, guys? Hi, Bill. Hello there. Hiya, how are you? <laughs> okay. Not bad, nice to meet you. Right, so basically, um, you're, you're known as Alien Bill. Can we, can we take you back um, before all this and tell us what actually started all this, please, Bill? You like my first recollection? Yes, please, darling. Right. The first one I can basically remember, which I've told Malcolm Robinson and lots of other people, uh -huh. um, I was about five years old and it was one Christmas Eve getting into the uh, midnight time and I saw a bright light at the window obviously being a little child being excited around Christmas goes up to the window and I saw this like bright star in the sky yeah and I was mesmerized at it for mm, I don't know 20 minutes half an hour mm -hmm. when I put my hands up and I felt a contact with this light in the sky and I held my hands up to the window and I just felt Welcome by something, and that's my first recollection. Right. So, and what, and and obviously you've you've gone on from there, yeah. Well, yeah. There's been a few years of gaps as I've grown up, mm -hmm. but I would say massively in the last five years it's gone a bit crazy. But in the eighties, I saw a lot of things as well, which I've reported to the press. But the last five years, all my hands light up a lot now. And I see a lot more strange things. Uh, right, we've seen your pictures, we've and been uh, asked where he's from. So we've been asked whereabouts are you from? You're from York, aren't you? I'm from York, but I was born in London. In London, right? Yeah, okay. that's where I was born. I say dropped off for a bit of fun. <laughs> dropped off. So do you yeah. feel as though you're not part of this world? Um, do I always feel a bit distant with it. The reason why I say that because we do have. Uh, one of our members in our paranormal group that right. um, feels the same way, you know. Well, when I'm in the fields alone in the early hours when everybody else is in sleep, yeah, I feel more at home then when I'm alone in the field making contact work comes to me and that's when I'm happy. Right. Okay. And uh, I'm referring everyone to the pictures that we've put on our KTPF page. So if you want to go and have a look up there because we will be talking about them in a moment um, because um, – uh, basically, you you do feel contact, don't you? You do have a sign when when you feel as though there's going to be a contact connection with you. Um, every time I get a contact, I film it. I have over forty eight thousand pictures. Mm -hmm. 
and I only filled a few hundred the other day outside my local pub, which shocked me because I was on the way to a field and they appeared outside a pub. Right, and these are all going into your new book? My new book is going to be come out next year. Okay, and and what kind of signs do you get when you when you when you get these sightings? It's always some form of light, mm -hmm. but it changes form a lot from being plainish white colours to brilliant like rainbow colours, and I've got loads of varied designs. Um, when you see what goes in the book, and some I've already put out, going at different conferences, have stunned a lot of people. Um, I can't explain all the ones I've got. I've got so many. And the other thing happened to me only a few months ago, which I took on my laptop down to London to show Malcolm yeah. and a lassie called uh, Annie Jones, who was involved in this phenomena with her husband, Steve. Um, I filmed some red orbs about the size of footballs around me one night, took 48 pictures of them, and I could see them with me naked eye, but other people don't seem to see them. No. Took these pictures of these balls around me, and when I downloaded them on the computer the next day, I said to my wife, something's wrong with these pictures I've taken. I said, still frames seven, eight, and nine, the videos, and I haven't videoed anything. Hmm. And Malcolm tested the eye camera. I use a little cheap digital camera, only costs 165 pounds. I don't use anything complicated. And he timed how long it would take me to video the shots that appeared on my laptop. And it was impossible to do it physically. Three short videos in, and there was a live entity on it making strange noises and make clicking sounds similar to a dolphin. Wow. And it was implanted in my camera and I only took still photographs. And I still have that and it's got an audible sound on it. Cool. So that's still being checked out. Right, yeah, uh, saying that, we've been asked by Rake and Dems, have you ever had any of these photographs verified? Verified? Yeah. Well, I've shown to other ufologists. Yeah. And other people have said they've seen similar things in different parts of the world. To, um, Mary Rodwell in Australia, who's done loads of books and conferences all over the place, and she's well known in Australia and other parts of the world, just emailed me the other day, and she sent me some of her pictures from Queensland of a white sphere in the sky with a burning tail on it, and it's one she took quite a few years back, and I sent her one of mine back up, taken in York, and I said, snap, these are some of the designs I've filmed down York, and I've got quite a few dozen of them almost matched the one she'd seen yeah. and the one that she had she thought she was the only one that anybody had ever seen before so now she's contacting me a lot more because we're taking similar pictures right well the four pictures you sent me okay um right. the light in the sky your arm and the, the mist yeah on the one of the mist um we put it on our uh, ktpf page on facebook and uh, we had one comment that came on from uh, somewhere, oh, there she is, um, from a Kim Ann. And uh, she said, I have a picture almost same, constant, constant, const, uh, constant, I can't say that. Consistency. Long. That's the word, I can't get my mouth. <laughs> get my there, tongue's so. tied. <laughs> Constancy, <laughs> that's the word. <laughs> yeah, she's saying that she's um, got one exactly the same. You know, almost the same, so she's quite um, interesting. Well, the mist that I see, the yeah. colour of that, what you see on there, isn't actually the colour that I film. I see it as a royal blue colour with my naked eye. Only on a few occasions does the blue colour pick up on the camera. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But this blue mist, I have now tracked it down to a mountain in Washington State with a fellow called James Gilliland yeah. at his Seti Ranch. And he has been there for a number of years, and he takes people out near this mountain on his ranch, and he sees glowing craft fly from this mountain. And apparently the American military have been trying to get him off this ranch for ages, because they go flying around it. And people have sat outside near this mountain before these lights appear and fly in the sky above their heads. Yeah. Blue mist, like royal blue colour, exactly what I get in the fields around York, and I've had him in Canary Islands and Cyprus with me, um, matches exactly what goes around these folk at this mountain, the same colour. Right. So it's a connection. Why do you feel as though your arm glows? It's, it's aching all the time. Is it really? Yeah, it aches all the time. It's like a mild toothache. Mm. Um, this started about five years ago after I photographed what I've been called, told were light beings in my front garden and also the called watches. And I filmed seven of them in my front garden. Yeah. 
the 14th of December 2009, quarter past 12 at night. Right. Now, for the sceptics among us, okay, of course. <laughs> there are many of them, aren't there, really? Whatever field the you're in. Yeah. Um, if they'd have said about maybe the flash or something or whatever when you took the pictures, what, what would your answer be? Oh, I've had that thousands of yeah. times. That's you know, right. You know, it's like... Well, I on. wear very expensive Ray-Ban glasses mm -hmm. when I go out because these lights that come to me mm -hmm. almost blind me for a second. The photographs don't even show how bright the light is. Um, the flash, it's easily ways to disprove that totally. Yeah. There's loads of ways of disproving it. It's impossible to take pictures that I've taken. A guy called Tony um, Cowell, not a brother of Simon Cowell, right. found a member of Bose Electronics, met me by accident in York. He was staying at a hotel over the road from a pub I go in. Mm. And he's retired now, but he was a founder member of Bose Electronics, which is world famous. Happened to be in this pub at the time. And he was into ufology from only a few years ago when he was big mansion he has in Kent, he saw a craft fly out of the ocean one night after he walked into his garden from a dinner party and that changed his mind completely that something was going on. So he heard I was called Alien Bill, sat down to have a chat with me, I had a look at my photographs and told my friends that sat with me, why are you laughing at this chap called Alien Bill? I have cameras that cost nine and a half thousand pounds, cannot take pictures that he has taken with his hand like that, it's physically impossible. There's something different happening with this fellow. Yeah. Uh, that was a few years ago. Uh, I'll let anybody have a look at them and check them out. They won't be able to recreate what I have filmed. Sometimes when I'm in the fields and I'm taking pictures, I see a glimpse of a light in the sky and I point the camera in that direction. And the camera picks up things that I got even see with naked eye. And on odd occasions, the whole of the field I'm in, the sky and the farmer's edge and the grass, completely disappears and I just get amazing designs of lights in front of me and for 15 or 20 seconds or so I can't see the field anymore mm -hmm. and I always just get one picture I never get a chance to take another but these amazing designs just appear in front of me and um, I always get some sort of photograph there's many of these around obviously um, you know uh, the there's quite a few people that is really into this like yourself um, and I've always maintained that there's too many of you, if you understand what I mean, to actually say that there's nothing going on. You know, That's you right. understand what I mean? So, you know, it, it, there's got to be something going on around somewhere, isn't there? Well, there's only one photograph that's going in my book um, that I didn't take. Right. And my wife took it outside our house a few years ago. Yeah. Because um, I was looking at these objects through binoculars that magnify 50 times. Mm -hmm. And it was a sphere about ooh, 30 or 40 feet across. Yeah. And you could see it with naked eye. When I looked at it through binoculars, I could see the internal workings of this sphere. And it was lit up inside. I don't know if I could describe it. Mm. It's similar to disco light tubing. Wow. Where you get all the little yeah. lights moving around inside the tubing at disco lights. Yeah. And that's what I could see inside this sphere. And my wife went in the house and took the photograph while I was watching the binoculars because I was just hypnotized by it. And it lasted about 30 seconds and just switched off and disappeared. Mm. Um, again, we, we, we've asked a question on, on the chat room. Um, have you ever read, uh, this is nothing, I don't know what this is about. Uh, have you ever read the EXIF on the photo? Do you know what that's about? The EX, what was it? EXIF from... Uh, Someone have you found someone who could read the EXIF from the original photos or something? I, I, no, I, no. I'm assuming that's yeah. a technical thing. It, uh, basically, it would prove that uh, no flash was activated. Oh right, is that what it's all about? Yeah. yeah. And, and she said, um, "Have you ever thought about sending them to ASAP?" Where's that? Um, ASAP, ASAP. Uh, that <laughs> I can't remember what it was actually pronounced. Um, it's to do with. Let me just find it for you. Um, the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. Oh no, I haven't heard of that one. You've not heard of no. them. <laughs> um, no. Yeah, they've um, they've been going for quite. They're a UK-based education and research charity 
dedicated to scientifically investigating certain things. They, they don't just cover ghosts or anything like that, which is our field, really, um, personally. But they also right. cover UFOs and, and other stuff like that. You know, so. Well, I am trying to find some of the researchers while I'm still working on this book to mm -hmm. take some things to it so they can examine everything that I've got. Mm -hmm. And I've got some of the friends trying to work that out for me. So I'm well up for that because they'll blow their minds. Oh, I yeah. had some friends yeah. years ago in a bar called the Lysander Arms and full of golfers, as there is in most pubs. Mm -hmm. And these lads used to always say to me, um, you never stay with us all night in our pub, but you always go somewhere else. Yeah. He says, why do you stay for us for a change? He says, if I do, you will get a visit because I've changed my routine. They went, oh, that CG stuff you do on your computers, blah, blah, blah. I says, well, I'll show you lads later and you're guaranteed a visit. So at 10 to 11 the night, I walked the full length of the bar to go to the toilets. When I came out, about 40 foot away from the end of the bar where they were sat, there was about eight of them in, sat at the bar, I pointed to the window next to the pool table, and I said, you've got a visitor at that window. Now I'm going to show you something. Walked up to this window, and I took about six pictures of a white light entity with streams of white lights in it, almost like a figure of somebody, but the window was glowing. Showed these lads straight away till it faded away, and that it was blown off, and they don't say about me doing CG computer work anymore. Well, that's good. It's good when you can prove that, isn't it? You know, I think that's the, some, the trouble with CGI these days. It, it, it becomes the excuses, if you understand. Yeah. You well, know, the story I just told you there, yeah. I went back three days later, and I always print off the pictures on the A4 size. I carry a haversack around with me yeah. with quite a few hundred pictures in all the time to show people because I feel like I'm a teacher and I have to show them something every time I'm out to find the right people. When I went back to this pub three days later, they saw me at the window next to the pool table looking at my picture, and I was saying to myself, There's something not right here, lads. And they went, too flipping right it isn't. What the heck did you picture of that for a window the other day, Bill? <laughs> I says, that at the window was fine. I expected something like that. I says, what isn't right is you've got a different window here. The window frame that I filmed at, it had tongue and groove around it on my picture with chrome metal clasps on it. It didn't exist in the pub. It was a different window. But they saw me take the picture, and you could see the reflection from the window of the TV screen in the corner of the bar what was on the program as well at the time matched completely. But the window frame is a totally different window. It doesn't exist. Isn't that intriguing? It is very intriguing. That's, very intriguing. that's just weird. Yeah, you know, that is intriguing. Um, so um, you, you're obviously doing this book. What's the book going to be called? Have we got a, a title for it yet? No, I haven't got a title. My publisher will be playing equity that I haven't got a title before I've done this radio show, but I wasn't rushing it just to put it on the radio show. No, 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 that's obviously, that's not a problem. No, it'll, it'll come to me. I keep jotting things down, but I haven't yeah. got it yet. Right. Um, well, when, it, well when, you, when you've when you got it and, and you know when the book's coming out, just let us know. We'll tell people. Yeah. Uh, well, it's going to have quite a few hundred of my pictures in it. Yeah. The uh, publisher I've seen in York, they'll still after me in London for quite a while, but I've met somebody in York and he says in 40 odd years of his publishing career, he's never been presented with a project like this. So he was dumbfounded when I showed him what this book was going to be about. Uh, he's chuffed a bit to uh, help me get it out there. Yeah, yeah. But going, I think going back on your last story, um, uh, Ghost Rider said, could it have anything to do with time travel, do you think? I think it possibly has. Yeah. The light beings, as they've been called, at somebody else that's seen these pictures, says they'd seen similar things before but never photographed them when they feel they've had an experience or been abducted. Hmm. They say they're all called light beings or the watchers. They're from about 9 foot to about 16 foot tall, made of pure light, but amazing designs. When they appeared in my garden, the garden went a misty, bright brown-orange colour. And over the rooftops, over the road, you could see some more almost appearing, similar design, like they were watching these appear to me. And I only got, again, one photograph of that, and the gun. Everyone that's seen it have been absolutely stunned with this photograph that I have. That's when I started getting my hands aching and lighting up. It was not long after that. Does it hurt when this happens? It doesn't hurt a lot. No. It just goes a bit numb, almost like a toothache. But right. extraordinary enough, only yesterday afternoon, at half past two in my living room, I was having a snack 
on a tray in my living room and my wife was doing some work on the computers in the corner. And she heard me shout out, I've just had an electric shock in my right hand. Hmm. She said, I thought it was your left hand that always ate. I said, no, this has happened in my right hand. And it felt like I just had an electric shock. I said, I'm going to get my camera. So when I got my camera out straight away, photographed my hand, and all the hand from my wrist down was glowing like I had a white mitt on it. Just a mitt, and you could only see the tips of my fingers. But strangely across my wrist was a clean white line, like it was a glove, and the rest of my arm looked totally normal. And I took 10 pictures of this. And that right hand now, since yesterday, is still aching, like my left hand. Uh, and that only happened yesterday afternoon. Wow. I was really surprised. And I'm a bit bothered about it, because that's the hand I hold my Budweiser with when I'm having a drink. <laughs> and I don't want to be dropping them all over the place. It's too expensive. <laughs> You don't suppose it's got anything to do with, I don't know, um, some sort of radioactive sort of thing that's making it glow with you, you know, there's no connection. No, there. I'm not near anything radioactive. No, it's, I mean uh, some sort of, you know, thing that would make it glow that they put on you or something. I right, sure. I'm going to still have to find somebody. Well, I will do eventually to try and explain this to me because it just puzzles me. Yeah. But I'm quite it's... happy to do it. In fact, if it wasn't happening, I'd be disappointed. Yeah. When I look outside my window now here, I see something that I call nicknamed fire stars, right. all flying from right to left, and I can see thousands of them round about what would be cloud height, and I can see them in the daylight as well. Yeah. A fellow yeah. called Benjamin Krem I met in London, who's, bless him, who's 91 now, mm. um, saw some of my pictures, and he said, I have something called my etheric vision. I see things on a different plane. And I've been given this gift. And he seemed to understand what I was talking about. And he yeah, was stunned yeah. when he saw my pictures. Well, at the end of the day, whatever it is, it, it is a gift, isn't it? Whatever you're, you're experiencing, whether it be mediumship or, or whatever, it's a gift, isn't it? That you have to, in a way, try and respect. That's right, I do. You know. That's why last Friday, when I left my local pub around the corner, and I was telling my friend, as it gets later into the evening, my hands get heavier in H more and I feel I have to go somewhere and contact's coming on. So I said, I'm going to go to a field soon. When I went outside of the pub, one of the lads called um, Dave Richmond, who was in a brilliant band called Glamour of the Kill, came outside with me to have a smoke. And he suddenly saw me getting my camera out. And I took one picture I said I was going to take before I was going to the field to let him know I'm coming. And as he watched me do it, I says, they're already here. This hasn't happened before. And I saw, like I described to you earlier, this blue mist I could see in front of me. So I carried on taking the pictures. And I was there for a quarter of an hour. And I took over 300 pictures in the end. When I ciphered through them, they don't always come out clear. 266 had images on right outside the pub. And I showed David them straight away I was doing this. And all he kept saying was, that's just amazing. Amazing all the time. says, I'll be a witness on your radio show when you show me that book. That's why I've mentioned his name tonight. Yeah. Because he yeah. watched me doing it. And then I went off to a field till 2 o'clock in the morning, took another 210 pictures, came home, went to my back garden and took another 30. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning before I finished what I call my ET night shift. Yeah. Because I do a lot of them with them. I feel I'm obliged to do this. Otherwise, I feel like I'm letting them down. Yeah. Bill, can we, just, can we just qualify that on these pictures, are you actually using the flash? Oh, yes, the flash goes. Yeah. Uh, the designs that come on it cannot be created from a flash. It's been checked out by some other folk anyway. Right. But I'll let anybody check it through. But uh, these images are on there. A flash can't create them. It's impossible. Right. Okay, okay. So um, what, what's your, what, what's your uh, long-term um, progress going to be on this? What, what, do, what do you plan... Uh, what would happen in the future for you? Well, Malcolm Robinson's, like he said to me up with this show, I'm doing another one um, on the 6th of November, um, KWN, mm -hmm. so with um, Tina Marie Cower, she'd been in touch with me. When Malcolm told her about me, she said, it's a no-brainer, I want that alien bill guy on my show. So I'm booked in to do an hour with her on the 16th of November. And he's just trying to get me more exposure, is Malcolm. Because yeah. when I met him in London um, about seven or eight months ago, and he spent five and a half hours with me at this hotel with my wife there and some other friends from London, Andy yeah. Jones. 
Um, he says in 35 years of doing paranormal ufology, he'd never seen any, as I call them, my X-Files, like it in his life. He was stunned. I says, you're like a little child, Malcolm, <laughs> in a free sweet shop and toy shop. He didn't know what to buy next. I was showing him all these pictures to him. Uh, and he's chuffed a bit. We've become best friends since. Uh, so we're going to do a lot more work together. Yeah. We're meeting in Markham next year with Tina. And we're going to do a radio show and a conference from Markham next September as well. Right. Okay. So you'll let us know about them when you, so we can advertise them for you. Sure. Yeah. It'll be a pleasure. You know, this if you just email us, um, e email me and then I'll, uh, I'll make sure that everybody knows about it. Okay. Well, they definitely need to know this. It's important. Yeah. Do, do you feel you will um, one day get actual con con um, contact with something? Well, I feel like they're building me up to something. It, it seems so, like it, doesn't it? That's what Malcolm just got back from South End on Sea yeah. earlier today, and he rang me early on, and he says they seem to be changing things around you on a different level, Bill, like they're building you up to some sort of, crescendo or something that you have to do in the end mm. and that was what I feel is happening to me so and I'm quite happy about it I'd be disappointed if it wasn't happening yeah yeah because obviously after all this you'd want something to happen wouldn't you well we were in Fort Aventura in Canaries just over a year ago and it's not just my hand that's lighted up when I've held other people's hands and then handed them a camera and I've concentrated the lights that I could see above the sky they can't see Hmm. Just take a photograph of your own hand. When they've had a couple of goes, say, it's not working, but they don't like me. Concentrate again, and I will get them to let your hand up. One of my friends that I met there called Alex Blaze Juski, who lives in Glasgow, lit his hand up a couple of times. Another fellow called Scott Froggy in London lit his hand up. He went all weepy, came all emotional. He said, what's that for you, Scott? He said, made me all emotional, ain't him, but something just happened, didn't it? Well, sure. Both these guys says, put our names in your book, our hands lit up, in the hotel at Fort Aventura, which was an open bar in the back, end where about 700 people go in the plaza, and put our photographs in, and we'll back you up to the hill, what you did to us on that day. You were blown away. So, and I said, you'll get ridiculed, they're, they're not bothered. It says they've changed them completely. Wow, wow. It's a fascinating story, I must admit. And I do hope that one day you do get some sort of connection, to, you know, after all this that you've had, you know. Well, what I mean? because I've even had confrontation with the police in York. I yeah. go to the back of some churches and on the York Nearsmeyer, yeah. the race course, and they've seen me then the early hours of the morning thinking, what's this guy doing out there with a the camera? And I wear baseball bat and shades because the bright lights come to me because it hurts my eyes a bit, so I wear really good lenses. Yeah. And they have pulled me up on a few occasions, but now they've got to know me. But one occasion when they stopped me, and I showed them pictures I was taking at the back of a church. Can we have a look at your camera, sir? They saw my hand lit up and says, is your camera broken, sir? What's this strange light on your hand? That's how it's supposed to be. I was just doing my research and making contact. What do you mean, sir? Have you been drinking? <laughs> well, probably have, yeah, but my camera hasn't, has it? He says, what other pictures have you got there, sir? So I showed them in my bag. What other pictures I've taken? And I showed him a picture of lights above the church had been round my head. And then they looked at each of these two policemen and went, he's one of them. And then they sort of just suddenly clicked. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, it was two o'clock in the morning. I says, now I've got to go to a field. And you've held me up. But I says, can I go now then? You can, sir. And I says, which one of you two is going to report this back at the police shop? I says, have you got an ex-files there? I says, off you go to your field, sir. We haven't seen you. <laughs> so off the winds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, on a lighter note, uh, somebody's asked, "Do you get? Do, does this occur when you're not drinking your Budweiser?" Oh yes, <laughs> loads of times. Yes, <laughs> I get that at all. I don't I'm know, to... but I must admit, I'll be honest with you. When it comes, that they're, they're just um, having a bit of a light joke. They're not. They're not. Um, ridiculing you in any way but there are skepticism out there isn't there and i think it's it's healthy to have it as long as it's not criticizing you know and, and disrespectful that's right i don't mind at all no i would let any of them look through any things that i've taken all these years yeah and they will not be able to pull any of it apart at all um thousand percent sure of that mm. would you like to see something like this dave uh well alien life form it's uh 
it's a fascinating subject for a lot of people, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, we'd be we'd be ignorant to think that we are the only species in the universe, considering the number of hundreds There's people of around York of years ago. I there. did an interview, sorry, did, on BBC. Mm. But in York, they were seeing lots of like orange balls in the sky flying around a few years ago, all over York and everywhere. Now they've been seeing lots of places around the world. I've had other witnesses in York when I've spoken to them on the outskirts of York. I call one of the fields my Gram Zero. When about four and a half years ago, I had 12 of these lights hovering above my head in a farmer's field. And 11 of them just switched the lights off. And one that was still lit up, shot from the field towards York Minster, mm. hovered about eight or 600 feet above York Minster for a few minutes. And then sidewind, it really slowed. It come back in a straight line, but came back like a snake, slowly back to me over the field. Lit up again, even brighter above my head in the field. The other 11 that disappeared just switched on exactly where they were in the first place, like Christmas lights above my head, and then slowly ascended further in the sky, and then just started flying around everywhere. Weeks later, when I was around at this Lysander arms bar, where I took this image at the window next to the pool table, yeah. there's a guy in there called Steve, who used to be an ex-pilot, says, I have filmed those lights that you had above your head, Bill, only one or two of them, they were bright orange colour, on my video. I believe you, mate. And he had them on video. Yeah. It's not intriguing. Yeah. Reiki Debs has asked, which is a, a feasible question, because uh, considering the technology they must have up there, um, why would they want to contact us mere mortals? Have you had uh, any inkling? Well, I don't class any of you as of mere mortals. I class you all of ETs. You all are in your own right. You just haven't learnt it yet. So you shouldn't yeah. use the word mere mortals, because you're not. It's funny you should say that. We've often thought about whether we've been put on this. You know, the, the likes of, some people may think this is a stupid analogy, but the likes of uh, Return to Witch Mountain. And right. they say that when you die, yeah, coming away from that, you go up. Yeah. That's right. Isn't it, Steve? I don't use the word die either. I use the word change. Yeah. What do you, what are you saying about it? It is, but uh, I mean, the, the analogy of going up is it, just the same as going up in a, place, in, in, in a craft, isn't it? Isn't it? It's well, well, whether it be uh, the classic beam of light, yeah, which is exactly what the religious form says. Yeah. Got, are we going home, so to speak, you know? Well, my mother-in-law, like my wife, who's a valley teacher, who lost her back with cancer a few years ago, mm. I was always talking to her and she could never get her head around my ET contacts and strange things down around me. But in the end, she changed her mind and came to my way of thinking. Yeah. When she was in a coma hospital, I used to speak to her before that, when you've learned how to change, Pat, come and visit me. Mm. And two days after, she'd lost her back with cancer. My daughter was staying at our house, came around, she was upset she lost her nan. My wife had a hug with my daughter and me about 8 o'clock in the evening, two days after she'd uh, passed away. And I said, you've got a visitor. I have to get my camera. My wife thought I was going to film my ET buddies. She said, you can't go film them now. I've just lost my mum. I said, I've something to show you. I stood in front of my fish tank in the living room, pointing my camera towards my daughter in the ceiling. And what you call ectoplasm appeared like a cat's tail with a dark end in it, with loads of lights and orbs coming out of it. And down the side of my leg, right next to my daughter, was sobbing her out on the couch. And I went to my daughter. Here's your nana back. Here's your mum back. I went, well done, Pat. It took you two flipping years to pass your driving test. And you learn how to change in two days. Who's a clever girl then? <laughs> and I filmed that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Oh, and I've shown that to a few people and all. And they stand. Could the you make any of these churches videos? They want me to go visit them. And I says, I can't get involved in these filthy churches. Yeah. You'll overwhelm me. I have to stick to my ET contact. This was a family thing, so I did that for my mother-in-law. Yeah. Go on, Dave. Can you make any of these videos available for us to view? The video that I've got, I've only got those three videos. Right. I generally just take still pictures. These lights that appear to me are so fast, I couldn't video them. Um, the ones that I have got with the audible sound on, which I'm going to release next year, um, and I'm going to do a story on it, um, that, like I said, was implanted in my camera on lots of other occasions some of the pictures i've got with bright lights at the side of my body oh, and the bin in my house as well my camera when i get it out sometimes just fires off instantly in my hand mm. um before i even got it ready to use because there's been some light form around me and it's like 
he's not noticed us, he's going to miss us. So they just shoot my camera off sometimes before you even get hold of it properly. Mm-hmm. And then there's been a light or something out the side of me, mm. around me, all with strange colours around it. And it just fires off the camera instantly. Like this entity got inside my camera, don't ask me how, and set off these three videos in it, which I didn't even know were there till I downloaded it on the computer. When I put the memory card back in the digital camera, it still only shows 48 pictures of red orbs around me, size of footballs. Yeah. It doesn't show the video. The video only showed up when I put it into, obviously, it had to be a bigger piece of technology, the computer. Then it showed up. You still can't see it actually on the memory card that I took these orbs within this field. Isn't that strange? Yeah, very strange. They're asking whether there's possible to see these videos. Would you be putting any up at all on YouTube or are they already there? The ones on that entity out there, yeah, but I am going to arrange it and put these out. Okay. And I'm waiting until li- I've taken to somebody scientifically first and try yeah. and work out what the language is on it yeah. and how this occurred and then I'll get it out there. And you'll let us know so I can let the people know, yeah? Sure, yeah, I'll let you know. I'm okay, going to be out then. there. Right, well, thanks very much, um, Alien Bill. Um, Alien Bill. Everybody calls for that. <laughs> Alien Bill. Uh, it's been great speaking to you, and um, hopefully we can talk to you again. And let us know when the book comes out and anything else that you're doing. Just email it across, and we'll let everybody know, okay? I'll keep you informed, Susan. Okay. Thanks for the chat. Right, take care, my love. Okay, bye. Bye. Well, that was uh, Alien Bill and uh, what he, what's been happening with him. And which sounds quite intriguing, but as I say, um, there is um, people out there that uh, can be skeptical. They can be skeptical with us, and you know about ghosts and stuff, can't they? But uh, they can. Uh, me for one, uh, I'm one of the. Uh, when it comes to what he's telling us, I'm one of the skeptical ones. Well, I'm, I, I mean, the pictures, four pictures yeah. we've got there. Any one of those could be caused by weather conditions. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd be interested in seeing better pictures. Yeah. Well, as I say, it's going All to be a videos. bigger book. Oh, All the, videos. the videos, yeah. Videos would be good. So, but uh, but they've had some uh, interesting comments on the uh, chat room. Uh, like I say, there's a loads of people. Hold on, I missed that. Uh, there's loads of people who um, will back him up, which he said. Um, but there are places you, you can go. And you can find a ba- find out about the E X I F. It's um, uh, Doc Savage says it's Ghost Hunting 101. Um, know what an EXIF um, well, and how to read it. Well, okay. Can I just can I just say you can get this, you can get the same thing from a photograph on on the internet. If you right click on it and, and yeah, and it tells you everything there. Yeah, the properties. No, yeah, the properties, it, it tells you all. Okay, but uh, as I say, it was very interesting. It's part of the paranormal, and yes, uh, it's you know. Now the next what guy. What are you looking at there, David? <laughs> well, actually, while we've been on air, Andy sent me an email. Oh right, uh, okay. With a photograph from Friday night. Right. And he's asking if I see what he sees. Okay. But I can kind of, but I'm gonna I'm gonna wait till I view it on my screen at home. Right. Okay. Before I actually comment. Well, uh, in about twenty minutes' time, we're going to be ringing up. Um, or connecting with Peter A. McHugh, okay, and he's just published a book recently called Zones of Strangeness, an Examination of Paranormal and UFO Hotspots. Um, he believes that paranormal phenomena occurs and that many UFO experiences are generally anomalous. Um, he contends that if we want to obtain a comprehensive understanding of ourselves and the nature of reality, these enigmatic phenomena can't be ignored so we're going to find out more about that and about the many reports worldwide of unexplained phenomena and um, also uh, the, the variety of them for example cat mu- cattle mutilations sightings of strange animals as well so um, and other types of uh, manifestations that should be quite interesting uh, so uh, we're, uh, we're going to speak to him you know in that as well now um, just to, uh, uh, before we, you know, as I say, we've got 20 minutes, just going to uh, put our advert on for you, so I'll speak to you in a, just a few, few minutes, and we'll be right back after these words. The Paranormal Intelligence Gathering Services Ghost Store is a one-stop shop for all of your ghost hunting gadgetry needs. Run by ghost hunters for ghost hunters, the shop is filled with all of the latest in investigation equipment shipped in from all around the world, from high-quality digital dictaphones to EMF pumps. 
infrared illuminators to laser grid pens, CCTV equipment to data loggers. All of our equipment has already been imported, so you can buy it safe in the knowledge that there will be no hidden costs. And with our postage promise, you'll never pay more than the actual postage price. So visit www.the-pigs.co.uk forward slash ghost store. Right, okay, we're back in the in the hub, and uh, as I say, and we've I um, uh, just want to let you know that uh, um, if you just joined us, we did manage to do our vigil uh, last night with um, mysterious Mysteria Paranormal. That's we, the word. We did, we and did. Um, it was nice to meet Ramon and and the rest of the ghoulies. Um, that was, and uh, yeah, the MGA. Yeah, the MGA. Uh, was it Mysteria Ghouli Army or something? Wasn't yeah, it? That's the Faye one. and everybody. Why and they call themselves the Ghouli Army? I will never know. <laughs> Don't know. But uh, as I say, um, it was. Uh, we we left about one o'clock, didn't we? I didn't expect to stay stay that long. I was going, wanted to, after what happened on Friday night. I really wanted to uh, get back home and um, thinking about my poor dog and the fireworks, wasn't me? Yes. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, it wasn't a bad night. But um, as I say, um, we we did have a good night on Wednesday and Friday night. Just to recap on what we did, we said we'd talk about it, and we're going to talk about it mostly throughout the night. Okay, so um, we're going to bring David back in now. David, can you tell us about the history of Gorse Hall and yeah, what it's famous for? Yeah, sure. It has a long history actually. Um, there was an original wooden structure that was built there. I couldn't exactly tell you when uh, there's records of it going back to the 1600s and I'm sure earlier than that uh, and then a couple called John and Jane Leach bought the property uh -huh. uh, they had a famous granddaughter in Beatrix Potter right. uh, who used to frequent the house on holidays etc um, now when John and Jane Leach passed on the house stayed empty uh, until I think it was 1891, yeah. when a gentleman called William Stores bought the house. William Stores owned uh, a large company in Staley Bridge, and he had interests all over the country, really. And he bought the house for his son George Harry Stores uh, as a wedding present mm -hmm. uh, when he married Maggie, and they lived in the house for. Well, the, the house was pulled down in 1910 after George's murder. Right. Uh, and it actually still, the, the stones themselves still stand, yeah. as I found out this week. Yeah. Uh, and make up part of the NatWest Bank in Staley Bridge. Right. But the, the house itself has always had a history in Staley Bridge and it's uh, loved by the community. Now, when we went up there on Wednesday, They've managed to dig out the foundations. They have. The Friends of Gorse Hall have been working for about 30 years, I would say now at least. Yeah. Uh, along with local schools who have gone up there and over time excavated the foundations of the Stone Hall. Mm. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that reignited the fascination in the murder of George Harry Storrs, with it being an unsolved murder. Yeah. It always breeds fascination. Uh, so, yeah, it's thanks to a lot of local groups, especially the Friends of Gorse Hall. Right. So who was this George Harry Storrs? George Harry Storrs was a local mill owner, uh, a big employer of people in Staley Bridge, as was the family. Uh, he was a quiet man. He didn't really socialise very much. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he preferred relaxing in his own rooms rather than being in a pub. Uh, he had two brothers... And I believe now a sister. Um, they all owned shares in the company after his father passed away. Yeah. But George always owned the controlling share mm -hmm. uh, in Stores, Sons and Associates or Stores, Sons and Company along those lines. Yeah. Um, his brother James, he liked the lifestyle that that brought. He was always seen at social gatherings, etc. Uh, wherever he was supposed to be seen, he was seen, mm. travelled around in his car. Whereas George was more uh, a working man. He walked pretty much everywhere. He had horses and carriages. Uh, he had a stable. He had a stableman in James Worrell. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but the carriages were used mainly by his wife and his niece, who they looked after, after Maggie Storrs's sister and brother-in-law, I believe, were killed in an accident, and they took on uh, Marion Minley, who was the niece, yeah. and she lived in the house with them. Right. Uh, and yeah, he, he, a quiet, unassuming man, really. He, he was well respected by the people who worked for him. Yeah. Uh, but he had quite a shaky last couple of months of his life. Mm. Um, there was talk that he was uneasy, that he was very worried. Uh, a few weeks before the, his actual murder, there was a scene where the living room window was smashed. Yeah. And a rifle barrel poked through the window. Uh, and George says there was two shots fired. I don't think that was ever proven by anybody. No. Uh, but it was reported to the police. And with there being no telephone system, there was no emergency systems in place. The police suggested that George installed a large bell on his house uh, to alert if there was any further danger. So he was obviously worried for his own safety, George. Yeah. Now, a couple of weeks after that, the bell rang, and every police officer in the area ran up to Gorse Hall, <laughs> uh, and the first two policemen to get to his front door were greeted by George Harry Stores, stood in the doorway, yeah. holding a, a little watch in front of him, <laughs> uh, and was greeted by, you took your time. You took your time. Or worse to that effect. Yeah. Uh, so the police were already kind of angry. Yeah. And then we had a typical boy who cried wolf story mm. on the 1st of November when the bell rang. And maybe people weren't as quick to attend yeah. as they could have been. Yeah. But this time it was for real. And George lost his life. Mm. Well, there's the uh, the lead up to um, what happened over, over the past week um, on Wednesday and Friday night. And and also more that we found that uh, David's found out on Saturday. Yes. So uh, we're going to leave it there for now, um, and we're going to come back to that after we've spoken to, spoken to our next guest, which will be in about eleven minutes' time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to uh, Steve to finish off the observations. Can I ask something on the observations from earlier? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. You were going on about uh, golf captured on CCTV. Yeah. I think the most famous one that I can remember, and I actually was looking at it while you were talking, was Henry VIII captured on CCTV, and it was actually discussed on this morning, the day after, at Hampton Court. Did you ever see that? Yeah. Uh, in the doorway. In the doorway, yeah. closing yeah. the doors. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Hmm. The I'm not. I, I'm not sure, to be honest. No. It's uh, one of the ones I've never been sure of. That's mm, why. Yeah. I, Even I mean, Andrew it, said it was a man in a costume. <laughs> It, it probably was, but I would like to see the original original video yeah. rather than what may or may not have been edited yeah. on TV. Yeah. Andy707, that's not our Andy, he, he's um, in Essex. He said it was a man in a costume. That's his opinion. See, I, I love CCTV and that, what is actual yeah. video evidence. I would love to believe there is video mm. actual video evidence that yeah. we're seeing. Well, Andy, you are right. It is a man in a costume. And if, it, a ghost? and if it was Henry the Eighth, he would still be a man in the costume. Uh, but he would be. <laughs> he would, wouldn't he? I mean, to us, it would be a costume. To him, it would be his everyday It's not work. an opinion, it's fact. Come on then, Andy, what makes you say that? Was you on the investigation? Was you there? So it was well covered by the newspapers. Yeah, uh, it was well covered, yes. And I don't think anyone actually gave a definitive description of what. It actually was. Right? No, no, I think I think they made a big deal about the fact that those doors shouldn't have opened like that. Yeah. Well, it was a an, a regular occurring thing, I believe, which is why they put pointed the camera on those doors originally. Right. But it right. could be, it could have been anything, couldn't it? He's just come back and said it was a fact that the doors blow open. I know someone who worked there. Okay. okay. <laughs> So that answers that in a uh, way. In a way, it does. Okay, then carry on, right. Steve. We've got ten minutes. Uh, on March 6, 1982, I suddenly fell off the couch with Port's door. While on the floor, I was crying hysterically, and the only thing I could see were red and blue flashing lights. I could I could not hear anything. Uh, this lasted for about ten minutes. My mother was going to take me to the doctor, but I talked her out of it. Okay. Uh, the next day, my stepfather had a heart attack at home. 
uh, just after dinner and passed away, when the ambulance pulled up, they kept their siren and lights on. The, the, fr the front of our room in the house was filled with red and blue flashing lights. Mm. I could not hear over the sound of the siren. I sincerely regret that I did not have the ability to interpret the vision from the day before. Uh, what if I had understood what I'd seen better? Would I have been able to do something to prevent the death? Interesting point. Mm. Do we have the right to uh, stop things that are meant to be? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the problem with, uh, with people with dreams like this is knowing what the dream is, is about uh, and, and, and knowing what's the dream and what's the premonition. Yeah. Uh, my personal advice would be to... Uh, do you do a dream book and write everything down? Yeah, I, um, I, I used to have a, an encyclopedia of dreams. It was yeah. very good to refer to. And uh, obviously, uh, they they reckon when you do have a premonition, it's uh, anything up to six weeks. Right. Just to uh, go back on that, that question that David was asking, uh, Andy said, the paper's got it wrong, yeah. The mystery was the doors opening by themselves. The guy in the costume was a member of staff closing the doors. Okay. Okay. But so the press got the, got the wrong end of the stick. I see. So that's what that was about. Well, in cases like that, don't you think sometimes the press are given the wrong end, wrong of, the end stick of the stick by yeah. people like Hampton Court? Well, well I don't know. What mind do you, you, hang on a minute. No, the, 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 paper, <laughs> the papers... Uh, I'm I'm sorry, but I'll never believe the papers. Well, we got to be careful here. No, 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 no. I do not. Papers I, have got an habit of twisting the news. Uh, they also they also have a, a habit of putting a false headline. Oh yeah. Up, and when you read this, there's nothing to do with the headline. Yeah. So, to my mind, the papers will do whatever it takes to sell to sell paper. a paper. Yeah. Oh, totally. Agree. <laughs> totally. <agree. laughs> right. I'm glad about that, yeah. considering what you used to be. <laughs> uh, yes, no right. comment. Here's, here's one for you. Uh, my cell phone rang, calling my home phone. Oh, yeah. Uh, the story goes like this. Uh, our family arrived home from holiday, a uh, holiday weekend of camping. I was the first in the house putting things away in the kitchen. After about a minute, the home phone, phone rang in the kitchen. I walked over, and as always, I looked at the phone display. To see who was calling. Mm. To my amazement, it was the spare cell phone sitting on the counter on the other side of the kitchen, uh, about five feet from where I was standing. Mm. Again, I was the only one still in the house. The spare cell phone we rarely ever use. Uh, I picked up the home phone and dead silent, no pun intended. I also note that I was not even close to the counter while in the kitchen. My wife then walked into the kitchen and I showed her the home phone display uh, who just who just called to confirm it was my cell phone. We walked over to the spare phone, looked at the last call placed and it was a home number showing uh, the time, day being at the moment of the call. Uh, note there were no other calls in recent calls on the cell phone uh, with the whole number on it, uh, home is not an old haunted home at all. It's a new home, and we have never experienced anything unusual since we've been there in the last 10 years. Though it could certainly be the spirit of a family member, it was certainly the strangest thing you've ever experienced. Yeah, well... You may imagine your own, your own phone calling you. And it's, <laughs> it's someone that knows the home phone number anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to... Well, um, welcome home. I'm going to uh, basically um, stop you there anyway. Yeah, well, my next one is quite long. Yeah. The reason why I'm going to do that is because John, our uh, John, um, notified me to a place um, online, and I can't find it now, <laughs> where um, there was an article that was put in um, on the internet on the 31st of. Um, October, and uh, let's see if I can find it, unless John can give me, oh no, there's a link, and um, it's by one of our listeners, funny enough, and it connects with that, do ghosts live among us, and I'd like to quote um, that uh, our Anita Savage, friend of ours, John Doc Savage's wife, um, She's um, 
uh, experience things like this about people living within similar sort of thing. And like she's quoted in one of her um, comments here, one of her articles, that if you have that sort of thing, you know, um, then why don't you just say, you know, um, you know, leave leave us alone. You do what you do, basically. And it, as she said, it's a matter of having that relationship and moving forward. Um. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I think it is when you're living with a spirit, don't you, Steve? I do. I mean, uh, we know we've had a spirit in this house ever since we moved in, mm. uh, and and occasionally he makes himself known, and but most of the time he just carries on with his own business and, and lets us get on with it. So I, I'm going to uh, just relay some of these comments here um, from some of the bits you've mentioned. Um, concerning dreams, Andy says, books on dreams are rubbish. <laughs> you need to know the person to actually interpret a, a dream, which I, I do believe. Um, Reiki Dev said, he means write the dream down in a book. <laughs> Tigger says, my uncle had a premonition. Once he knew he was going to die, the judge told him. <laughs> um, and Andy707 said it's something we are taught when training to be a psychotherapist there are certain symbols in dreams that we'll all experience, we all experience and they have meaning but the meanings will differ depending on the person's life experiences uh, Reiki Dev's personally believes that the only, only the person who knows um, will know what it represents so uh, Again, it's all down to interpretation. It is. It's all down to interpretation. And uh, if you see, talk about interpretation, if you've seen a picture on my Facebook I of a very late, what I call a very late Halloween picture, <laughs> Steve didn't hit me, I promise. <laughs> but, yeah, I definitely didn't hit her. I, <laughs> my blood vessel broke. I, I actually dreamt that, that, that I found a tenner. Only problem was I lost a fiver. <laughs> this is the thing. <laughs> but um, uh, we've got just a couple of more minutes before um, before we uh, contact the man himself. And um, just to let you know a little bit about him, as I say, um, he is a clinical psychologist, which I'm going to ask him what that actually is. Yeah. Uh, his qualifications include a PhD from the University of Glasgow, uh, awarded for a thesis on hypnosis. Uh, on his, in his book, um, as I said, um, there are. Uh, he's asking, can the reports be believed? Are the phenomena generally paranormal? Do certain areas really see an unusually high number of anomalous events? And what's behind the ma manifestations? Do they involve extraterrestrial creatures from other dimensions, time travellers, the workings of a human mind, or some sort of higher intelligence? Um, these are just some of the questions that Peter addresses. In his book, uh, it's a 560-page book, cites a mass of case material from the UK, the USA and elsewhere, and also includes foundation chapters that discuss theories about hauntings um, and other strange phenomena. So uh, what we're going to do is, um, I'm sure he won't mind one minute, so we're going to get him on the phone now. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. Not on the phone, you know where I mean. On the Skype. I'm going to find me thing. So let's give him a call. Hello. Hello. Hi, it's Suzanne. Hello, Suzanne. Hiya. Uh, you're live on air um, or right. online. <laughs> and uh, we've got people in the chat room here listening to you. So uh, if you'd yes. like to say hello to them. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Peter McHugh. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yes. Um, and uh, you've written a book that is very interesting. It seems to cover a lot of um, paranormal, for want of a better word, um, phenomena. And uh, uh, because sometimes when it comes to um, animal sightings and stuff like that, people don't don't like, the cryptozoologists don't like the paranormal um, tag. tag for it, if you understand what I mean. Yes, um, that's right. You know, so can you tell us, please, uh, first of all, um, a bit about yourself? Yes, um, I, I live in Scotland. Um, I used to work for, for, for about 30 years, in fact, as a clinical psychologist. I'm now retired. 
Mm -hmm. um, I've had a long-standing interest in the paranormal. And um, I, I, some years ago, I, I developed a particular interest in, in this question of whether there are certain areas that host an unusually high concentration of unusual or paranormal events. And as I started reading around the subject and doing some research into it, I decided to um, that I, I would be worth putting it, you know, putting my th thoughts together in a book mm. um, and the research, which turned out to be much harder work than perhaps I anticipated, because as I was working on it, some other book would come out dealing with the the area, so I felt I'd have to buy that, and it was almost an endless process. And in the end, of course, I had to be somewhat selective in what I could address. The book's quite th thick as it is with background chapters and so on. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite hard work, and um, the the other problem about this whole area is it's very difficult to actually know for sure whether, as you as you probably appreciate yourself, whether areas really are hot spots because we don't really have com reliable comparative background data. No. Um, if a place seems to be a hot spot, it, it could simply be that the ratio of reported to unreported events there is higher because it, it's caught the, the attention of some investigators rather than it being the true state of affairs. So it often, I think, in the end comes down to a sort of an impressionistic judgment about whether a place could be described as, as, as a hot spot or not. Right. And it says here that you're a clinical psychologist. Can you just explain what that is? Yes, psychology is, is, is the sort of study of behavior and experience, and clinical psychology is, is, is a branch of applied psychology uh, where the psychological methods and uh, uh, procedures are applied in, in, in sort of treating patients with problems of various types. Uh, throughout my career, my, my main area of work was what, what would now be called adult mental health um, which in practice you know, often meant dealing with people with you know, depression, anxiety, phobias, um, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder and, and problems of that nature. Mm -hmm. I also worked to some extent with children, but that was, that was much more of a, a minority sort of aspect of or, or a small proportion of my work. Right, okay. Now, we've heard a lot of um, uh, possibilities that... Um, when it comes to paranormal phenomena, everything seems to happen at once. If there's a ghost sighting, uh, some in, in some areas there could be a UFO sighting at the same time, uh, blah, 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 and they can all connect. Do you have this theory? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. I, I, I think that, as you hinted at earlier, there is a, a tendency in this field for people to sort of see their own area of interest, be it ghosts, UFOs, or cryptozoological uh, phenomena are sort of separate from the yeah. others and they can be a bit sniffy about the other areas um, as you say people interested in cryptozoology some of them get a little bit twitchy if if you start talking about bigfoot encounters with the paranormal aspect yeah equally i think in the ufo field there are some who seem to be rather ignorant about and hostile even to the the idea of the paranormal and on the other side of the fence, among people in, interested in the mainstream psychical research, I think there's a fair amount of perhaps lack of interest or knowledge and an appreciation of the overlap. And one of the things that really fascinates me is precisely these overlap cases. I think there, you know these these cases are fascinating because to me they suggest that there are possibly common mechanisms and a common agency behind many of these phenomena. And that it, it's more sensible, perhaps, to think about them as belonging. If you strip away the the rubbish, the, the hoaxes and the mis misperception and so on, but if you take that out, it's more sensible to think of all this as being part of one domain mm. rather than separate areas. Now, have you ever encountered anything yourself? I'm not sure. Now, that, that sounds a bit ambiguous, but, but I'm not sure um, whether I've ever had any sort of... Um, experiences that could be described as paranormal. I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, this is what I think when I was a teenager, I was reading about ESP tests, card guessing tests. Yeah. Uh, and I, I picked up a deck of cards and the sort of an image of a, a card, I can't remember what one it was, the seven of clubs, something came into my mind. I cut the pack and it was the seven of clubs. Now, 
there was a sort of one in 52 chance, maybe, or even slightly less than that, didn't even include the Joker's chance that I got that right, but it could be that, you know, somehow I knew that card was there. Mm -hmm. When I tried it again, it didn't, I didn't seem to get remarkable results like that. There was another occasion when I was leaving my place of work, and I had a sort of uncomfortable feeling as I was going towards my car, and I discovered it had been broken into. However, the area where I was working at that time was a bad area for cars being broken into. There were lots of drug problems, social problems, and the car was parked on a road that I didn't really like parking it on for, for that reason. So that feeling, I, 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 I couldn't, I, did, I don't know whether there was an ESP element there or whether that feeling I had at that point was uh, can be ex purely explained in terms of normal mechanisms. Um, so from a personal point of view, I, I, I can't claim to have had dramatic paranormal experiences, but that doesn't make me doubt that other people have. No, this is it. There is a lot of scepticism out there, and uh, sometimes I think that um, people need to give people the benefit of the doubt. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, th I think it, it's, it's sort of uh, arrogant and uh, to assume that just because... Uh, I, you know, we, I haven't had an experience. It would be arrogant if I assumed just because I hadn't had an experience that no one has. Um, I mean, I can't speak, you know, Mandarin, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe there are people who can. And uh, so, I agree with you. Okay, we have a colleague with us here, uh, David Tate. Uh, David, Hello would like there. to uh, ask you a question. I just wanted to ask. Uh, I'm working for a website called Staley Bridge Town, and I, I, I'm doing what you would class as. I'm oh, sorry, David. I, I, I couldn't quite hear you there. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm working with a website called Staley Bridge Town uh, as what you would describe journalism more than anything. Uh, yeah. And we've covered uh, with UK Shadow Seekers Paranormal Team. We covered a hundred year old murder recently uh, last friday and we took some photographs and I, i've published one of those photographs on the internet and i just wondered why skepticism was always coupled with animosity could you why are people so angry with the skepticism um i suppose one of the problems is that, that, that with, with skepticism some people add to their skepticism uh, which uh, um, an element of derision or an element of superiority or, or even just plain nastiness um, so that um, if, if people have had experiences like that they may tend to uh, to generalize too much and assume that anyone who's skeptical is is dismissive of everything mm. um, uh, I call these ultra skeptics hyper skeptics yeah uh, they don't like being called that. They get nasty sometimes if you call them that. But um, I call them hyper skeptics, and um, except that a reasonable amount of skepticism is healthy. But uh, if it gets to an almost a religious, early uh, fundamentalist level, where it, it doesn't admit of any possibility that the phenomena under consideration could actually be real, then it's verging on sort of almost a delusional system. I'd say. Yeah. That sounds a good answer, that, actually. It does. You it almost does. twisted that so the sceptics are the delusional ones. So yeah. I, I, I'll go with that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that you, there are actually organisations and the central tenet of the organisation is scepticism. Mm. Uh, it's a bit like atheists going to church on Sunday. The atheist church are actually bothering to go just yes. to celebrate their atheism and share it with other people instead of staying in bed or having a, a late breakfast. Yeah, well, this is it. It's like um, one of our guests has just reminded me that uh, um, our guest last week, Dr. Kieran O'Keefe, people do mix scepticism with cynicism as well. So, yes. You know, but he also asked, what's your opinion on um, Carl Jung? Um, I'm. Not, I'll be honest here, and this is, this is I risk offending people here. I, I would say I'm not a great fan. Right. It may be, um, it may partly be the, the way his, his stuff is translated, but from sort of looking at his work, what little I've done, really, to be honest, I find it written in a sort of pretentious way. Right, okay. That, 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 that draws down the shutters. Um, and it, it, seem, it seems, of, uh, although people call Jung, or sometimes refer to him as a psychologist, his background was in medicine and psychiatry, and, but he was more, I think, of a sort of a, 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 a mystical philosopher, as, as, in a sense, in, in a kind of rather 
literary way um, rather than, I'd say, a scientific sort of psychologist. I don't find his concepts terribly clear. And as I say, it's the style of writing, the convoluted passages that, 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 that put me off. I'm one of those people, to be honest, if I, if I turn on a film, I, if I record a film yeah. on television and I see five minutes of it, and it's, if it's all over the place, I get, I, I just, I delete it. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. You need to get into it for the first five, ten minutes, don't you? And that's not right. Get and lost. It, that's yeah. right. And if I find people are writing in an unnecessarily convoluted way, yeah, I, 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 I don't like it. it. It puts me off, and I actually don't think it's necessary. This is it. Now, going back to your book, um, and uh, to quote one of your questions for it. Um, what is your theory when it comes to these manifestations? What do you think is behind it? Do you think it does evolve extraterrestrials or anything like that? Well, the, the, the view that I lean to, and I don't hold this sort of with great certitude, but mm. the, the view that I, I, I hold is that a lot of these manifestations may be theatrical performances, in effect, staged by a higher intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and this higher intelligence may be something that's always been with us. Um, it, it may not be necessary to think of it as being from some other point in space or from the future or from some other dimension or parallel universe. It may actually be, have been with us always, um, uh, willing and able at times of its own choosing and with a, perhaps a tripsterish disposition Hmm. to manufacture phenomena. And it may do so in a way that deliberately includes ambiguity and deniability um, so that you'll get manifestations such as a Bigfoot appearing in conjunction with a UFO sighting that by the, its very nature that sort of report will tend to be dismissed by people as too impossible to believe. And yet that that could be part of the plot to sort of generate phenomena that actually do cause dissension and um, doubt. I must admit, I have recently heard that theory that maybe Bigfoot is an alien that's popped down for, you know, a wander, so to speak, you know, and then gone back again. I have recently heard a, somebody mentioning that that could be the possibility. There was a, a very interesting case. I don't know whether you're aware of it. It's in a book by an American man from Pennsylvania, Stan Gordon. Um, and it's called this, his book is called Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO book, Bigfoot case book. Uh -huh. And this particular incident occurred, uh, reportedly occurred in, I think it was October 1973, outside a place called Uniontown in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. Now, there was a UFO sighting involving about 15 people. And the, the thing seen in the, the sky was a, a rounded red object. But it seemed to come down on, on a farm area. And a chap whom um, uh, Stan Gordon refers to with the pseudonym Stephen Palmer, a 22-year-old man, went to this field on his father's farm, accompanied by two boys. And they saw a huge white domed structure, flattish with a flattish base, and a whirring sound was coming from it. And there was a smell in the air of something like burning rubber. Mm. And then they saw a couple of creatures, um, hair covered with glowing green eyes, no visible neck and long arms. One seemed to be over eight feet tall and the other was about seven feet tall. And Palmer fired um, a tracer shot in the direction. Then he fired a second one. And the larger of the two creatures reached up as if to grab the projectile. And at that point, the UFO just vanished. And the whirring sound disappeared, uh, leaving just a ring of luminosity. The creatures um, walked towards a, a wooded area, uh, back towards a wooded area. And Palmer fired at them with some live rounds, but neither of them seemed to be hurt. And there was some further odd phenomena later that night. Actually, Gordon and his colleagues arrived on the scene later. But um, th this, this, this suggests a definite sort of possible overlap between the two you know, categories here, the UFO and the Bigfoot phenomenon. And as I say, my, my reading of that sort of situation, and there are, there are obviously other cases, is that they're, they're, they're theatrical and attention-grabbing. Um, and I wonder from that point of view whether that's an intentional thing. It, it, the whole thing is a piece of drama. And the, the entities that are seen, in this case a 
Bigfoot creatures and the UFO um, were actually sort of stage props for the drama. Mm. In other words, after the, 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 the UFO disappeared, it didn't actually go anywhere. It didn't go to some other place. It, it, it just actually, in effect, in effect, ceased to exist because it had fulfilled, it was just a prop for the, the drama. Yeah, that does sound quite interesting, that does. Um, and uh, time travellers, what, what do you think? Do you think this is so, also connected? Well, one of the problems, I've mentioned t this time travel hypothesis in, in, in one of my background chapters in the book. One of the problems, of course, with, with this idea of time travel is, is it produces, it, it does give you problems with causality. Yeah. For instance, if I could go back into the past and uh, murder my grandfather, I couldn't really exist. You know, if, 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 if this was before I was sort of, uh, you know, my, my, my parents were sort of uh, conceived and so on. So I couldn't really exist. So you get into these sort of paradoxes, which science fiction, of course, deals with to some extent. Um, I'm, I, I can't dismiss the idea of time travel, but as I say, I'm, I'm, inclined to think that if there is a, some sort of intelligence playing games with us, it may, we do, it may not be necessary to, to in, assume it comes from a different time. It may, in a sense, have been with us uh, as long as we've been around. Yeah, yeah. We've all, also been asked, um, apparently, um, your, your views seem to be similar ideas um, on John Keel. Have you ever read him? Um, yes, he's, he's yes. similar reports. Yes, I, I, I think Keel spoke about ultra terrestrials, um, and um, uh, 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 I wasn't, uh, in, in a sense, uh, you know, he, I think he was talking about entities that actually did somehow exist mm. um, in addition to us. Whereas what I'm suggesting is, apart from us and the natural world, the only, uh, uh, this, this higher intelligence may be the thing that exists. And the entities that we're talking about may be, as I say, temporary creations rather than things with an enduring existence. But to be honest, uh, I can't say these ideas are true. And even if there is some truth in what I'm suggesting, um, it, 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 these ideas aren't mutually exclusive. You know, mm. it could be as well as what I'm talking about. There are actually extraterrestrials as well, or, or even time travelers. Yeah. Now, we've obviously heard that. Um of um, Roswell and all that lot in America, and we know that we've we've um, we've heard about our own version in um, uh, what, what's it called? Oh, Rendlesham Forest. It, yeah, Rendlesham yeah. Forest. Now, there's also a place in um, in the Midlands called Cannot Chase. Have you heard that, of this? That's right. Well, one of the chapters in my I've got a, a chapter on Rendlesham Forest in my book, and also a chapter on Cannock Chase. Okay, and uh, well, basically. Um, with the Cannock Chase one, um, from what I've heard, um, and we've had Lee Brinkley on the show before because he wrote a book about it. That's um, right. I've read his recent book, yes. Yeah, and uh, he was saying that um, it's basically a hot spot, literally, for everything. Um, ghosts in the, in the cemetery, um, our very own vampires or, or werewolves and, and UFO sightings, big cats as well or whatever – serpents it, it sounds like the place to be what's your theory well i i've looked quite i've spent a lot of time looking at this case made visits to the area as well and i, I know one or two researchers who, who are based not too far from there yeah and again it, it sounds boring but i'm not sure uh, you, a lot of the reports of uh, unusual animals. Um, I've seen a lot of reports from newspapers, but uh, some of them are a bit vague, you know, without maybe specifying who the witnesses are. Yeah. Um, another problem is that um, with uh, uh, with when you when you've got, for instance, a story about the chase Bigfoot, mm. um, you can get this the sort of possibility of hoaxing, and um, I, I one of the press reports. I read it had the title something like Bigfoot made me lose my baby and it was about a pregnant teenager who was driving across the chase and a, <laughs> and a big sort of hairy entity came out of the road and gave her a fright mm. um, and I think that the press report said something like this may have been a, a joker inspired by the, the, the paper's offer of a free meal for anyone who could provide a photo of the chase Bigfoot <laughs> so the, there may have been an element of you know joking and hoaxing um, 
another problem is in the Midlands, you, as you know, it's it's very overcrowded and yeah. there isn't much woodland and that. So, so Cannock Chase is one of the few bits around where people might go to get a bit of respite from the the, the you know the urban sprawl. Yeah. Therefore, and if it's got a reputation of people going up there, they they may notice things or, or even misinterpret things in some cases. Um, that um, that that, that the, you know where they wouldn't be driving around you know in Wolverhampton sort of looking at the sky, but they might be doing it up in in, in Cannock Chase. Mm. Um, if so I, I accept that some of these events on the chase may well be genuinely paranormal, um, it would be interesting to. If, if we, if as I say, if we had comparative, um, if we had comparative figures, yeah. you know, if we really knew what the true incidence was, mm. um, there, there's also a tendency when you look at Cannock Chase, and I've, 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 I've done this myself, and actually admitted it in the book. When you take an area, there's always a tendency to include cases on the periphery. Yeah. You know, so you, you include a case that's two miles away or, or three miles away. But the problem with that is unless you actually draw a, a boundary, you, it's very hard to define a hot spot, isn't it? Yeah, this is it. This is the thing. Um, well, there's been uh, programs on of late and stories in the press that you may have seen. Um, I'm not sure. But uh, the one that comes to mind is when people talk about contact. Um, and there was um, an MP in Yorkshire somewhere um, who uh, claimed that every so often he had intercourse with an alien and, and this, that and the other. And there's been other claims that uh, every time they have a KFC, they, have, they end up being abducted or something. What do you think when you hear these stories? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, Pete. <laughs> I, 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 to be honest, I'm I'm open-minded about the abduction phenomenon. Mm. Um, I've, I've 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 looked at you know theories about this, and obviously there may be exaggerated and wild and unbelievable reports. But yeah. um, the 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 prosaic explanations themselves don't necessarily satisfy me. Um, for instance, one one theory that you, you're probably aware of is that what sometimes happens is in certain areas there are unusual geomagnetic factors, and people might be influenced by yeah. the local magnetic field, and that might affect their brains, inducing hallucinations. Now, the, the problem with that, uh, to my mind, is that quite a few of these abduction reports are collective; they involve more than one person, and if if two people's brains were at that time affected by a magnetic field, you wouldn't really expect them to have an identical experience. No. By the same token, if you and I sat down and we took LSD at the same time, you wouldn't expect your experience and my experience to begin at a precisely the same moment, to have exactly the same content, and to end at precisely the same point. So, bearing that in mind, you know, I'm inclined to think that either that there's something objective out there going on that these, these people are experiencing, mm. or that there's something, some intelligence is, is generating the experience, and um, it's, 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 it's orchestrated. It's not a sort of just a fantasy in, induced by, a, by, by a, an ambient magnetic field. Mm. Um, so, so I think the, 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 there is something to the, the abduction phenomenon. I take it seriously. Um, yeah. And I, I, I can't rule out various possibilities, obviously. You know, the base... Uh, <laughs> God. <laughs> uh, we've just had a cremation here that this guy is fascinating. I'm ordering his book now. <laughs> oh, that, well, that's very nice. That's, uh, thank you. <laughs> <I'm very laughs> that was quite an <laughs> exclamation there, wasn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, enjoy the book, Andy. <laughs> um, but uh, as I say... It, but there's so much you cover in your book. You even mentioned cattle mutilations. What do you feel that uh, is behind these? Do you think it's down to animals or do you think it's ufology? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Um, I, I, as you say, I mentioned them in the book and I mentioned theories. Um, mm. as, as you may know, there's an area, for instance, in the United States called the San Luis Valley in uh, central Colorado, it goes down into northern New Mexico, and in past years, if not now, that area had a, had quite a few cases of cattle mutilation. Also, there have been reports of um, UFO sightings and other anomalies there. Mm. Um, and as, as you're also probably aware, there have been suggestions that um, 
the cattle mutilations may have been carried out by some kind of ultra-secret quasi-military organization or a part of the state or something that acting semi-independently. There have been suggestions that perhaps they've been sampling cattle to check on the spread of um, CJD or, uh, you know, uh, or, or disease in cattle yeah. that can cause human disease. The problem with that, I, I, it, I mean, when you think about it logically, if, the, if for instance, the U.S. government were, were doing something, why would they, they've got, they would have the resources just to buy their own cattle, wouldn't they? Either have their own ranches or purchase them from ranchers rather than carry out crimes that uh, um, bizarre things like that. So I, I, I'm not sure what's going on. Again, it could be, one possibility is that it could be a kind of bizarre and rather unpleasant manifestation of this sort of theatre This that I'm, I was talking about, a sort of the, the grisly theatrical performances. Mm. Um, for what purpose? Um, I, I'm not sure, but... Um, uh, but that's that's another possibility. Yeah. Some people have queried the possibility of occult groups, you know, yes. whether it's some sort of ritualistic groups. But I understand that there isn't a great deal of evidence of that. I think in in one part of the San Luis Valley, um, in in northern uh, New Mexico, some sort of uh, occult signs were found that, that were near where cattle were mutilated. But I, I don't know that that's generally the the case. Yeah. Well, I must admit, I've always I'm not a skeptic. I'm not, you know, when it comes to these UFO things, um, I have to be open-minded whatever I do. Um, yes. And I've always believed that there's, like I said to our last um, guest, there's too many people making these, you know, bringing up these stories and what have you and seeing these things. So there's got to be something somewhere going on. Yes, a case where in, in England, in fact, where I, where I was a bit more, I, I, I looked at it, uh, to try to be open-minded, but I came to sceptical conclusions, was a wood down on the south coast in West Sussex. I've mentioned this again in the book, a chapter on this, called Clapham Wood near Worthing. Um, now, this, this acquired a reputation years ago um, for dogs going missing. People would sort of take their dogs for a walk, and, and uh, there the were reports of dogs going missing. Yeah. Um, and then there was sort of suggestions there was a, a, a sinister um, sort of black magic group operating there, and the implication was that they were conducting sacrifices. And um, this this attracted quite a lot of attention. And if you look on the internet, you'll see quite a few items on this. Some of the items are quite credulous. You know, people seem to sort of swallow it hook, line, and sinker. But I looked into the case very carefully, and. Um, I actually came to the conclusion the evidence wasn't very strong. Mm. For instance, I was in touch with a local historian who told me that regarding the dog disappearances, um, it, it, there was a story that there was a local um, gamekeeper, I think, who, or, or a minder of, of, of a, an area where pheasants were kept for, for, sh for you know, hunting and so on. And this man had a hostility to dogs, and it was suggested that he may have been responsible for killing dogs that came into the wood. Um, and uh, there was also a story I heard that um, when after this area received a lot of publicity, there was one occasion when the local policeman arrived at the local church, and there was a ring of people, I think a, pe a group of people trying to form a circle, I think they were naked, around the church. And uh, that would be the friends of Austin McCarthy. Awesome to leave, <laughs> but they, they did eventually, but I think he got a bit of uh, verbal abuse, but they did yeah. go. Was that the Friends for Catty or something? That's right, yes. 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 So, yes. uh, yeah, it's just been mentioned on the uh, on the chat room. <laughs> yes. But um, but as I say, it, it's a fascinating book that you've got here because you seem to um, cover most topics, don't you? Because, like you say, I think you have to. You have I to get everything involved. Yes, well, it, I, I, I think these overlap cases are particularly interesting as, as well, as I say, because they, they do raise questions about the, the explanations and... Uh, I think the problem is when people have different areas of anomaly research, as it were, in different different ter different fen different fields, mm. ghosts of one area, UFOs another. They'll create theories that explain that particular, or try to explain that particular area, but those theories can be quite limited. And they, if you can get something that actually accounts for these overlaps, it's a much broader theory, and it may be more powerful in the end. Yeah, yeah, this is it. 
Now, obviously, when did your book actually come out, Peter? Uh, February 2012. Oh, right. <laughs> it's just that it says your, your recently published book. It's fairly, fairly recently, <laughs> just over a, about 18 months ago, yes. Right, okay. And um, is there anything else in the offing at the moment? Well, I've I've done quite a f I do quite a, write quite a few articles. Um, uh, you know, I send to magazines and online publications and so on. Uh, yeah. So, so, so that's that's I'm actually doing the se just the second part of an article on the UFO, Bigfoot, and paranormal overlap. Overlap. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So so what is it? <laughs> You're doing it for a friend of mine, uh, uh, Steve Mera. Yes, well, the first part was published in his magazine, Phenomena Magazine. You keep fading out on me for some reason. All right, I can hear you quite well. I don't know why you're losing me. Yeah, it's your vocal. You keep, uh, for some reason, you're just fading out a bit. But carry on with it. It will come back. I'll turn my volume a little bit then. Um, oh, let's have a look. Okay, try again. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you're doing it with Steve Mara. Uh, well, it, he he edits the, this, the that particular magazine. That's better. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Good. Yes, he edits that particular magazine. Yes. And I, I, I that, that article was published um, a couple of issues ago, and I'm doing a second a follow up part, mm. um, which I'll send I'll, I'll send to Steve. Yeah. Can't be sure that he'll publish it. Of course, he's the editor. <laughs> but oh, he's I'm, all right. Oh, Steve is. <laughs> working on that at the moment, yes. So, so basically, let's see. You've you've um, you've written back in two thousand and ten. There was renovation hauntings. Yes. Uh, and I'm assuming that's our neck of the woods, where where people do in, um, do the house up or something, and um, they start getting things happening. That's correct. Yes. So, what's yes. your theory about this? Well. Again, I, 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 I may, it may sound a little bit wishy-washy here, but it, it's, 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 it, this is another one where it's difficult to know um, whether there really is a connection because renovations are so common. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm having renovations done next week. Mm. Um, and, you know, you just go down any street and you'll see a van with Everest double glazing, C.R. Smith and all that sort of thing, or someone replacing a patio or something. So renovations are incredibly common and therefore... If occasionally a haunting develops or a poltergeist outbreak occurs and there's a renovation going on, um, it's, it, it, it may be it's possible to draw the wrong conclusion. On the other hand, it could be that the renovation has itself actually triggered the haunting. Um, from a spiritualist point of view, spiritualists would claim that sometimes you know, the spirits of the departed – kind of linger on mm. in, or have some kind of affectionate connection with a property and if um, changes are made they may not approve of that and they may show their dis discontent by producing uh, d disruptive phenomena um, so that that's the, and there are cases that if one takes them at face value support that version um, in you're based in the Manchester area, aren't you? There's That's a correct. case that you probably know about not too far from Manchester that um, it was some years ago when the Stocks Bridge bypass uh, was be in South Yorkshire was being created. Yeah. And built the workers on the road experienced odd phenomena and people thereabouts started reporting apparitional experiences and so on. Um, now, whether that was actually triggered by the road building, I can't be sure. Uh, but that that was a, a local one. There was also a pub I looked at. Uh, uh, well, I I, I I heard about and I made some inquiries in Cheshire, um, and I mentioned that in the article. Now I can't confirm these events really happened, but uh, uh, reportedly, uh, when some renovations were occurring at this pub, um, the, the you know, poltergeist type phenomena developed, um, and um, you know things were moved about and. Uh, the curtains, I think, were, were, were closed at night, were found open in the morning. Uh, tools went missing and so on. Mm. Uh, there was also a, a, a hotel in, um, I think it was Bedfordshire, Flit Flittick Manor. And this was reported years ago in a television series called Strange But True, yeah. where renovations were being carried out. And just around the time, just after the renovations had started, or, or were going on, um, ghostly phenomena were experienced by allegedly by hotel staff. Right. Uh, so, so the, I, I did in that article I mentioned a number of the cases, but I then discussed the, the possibility no. that this pro 
you know, the, the, the various various possible. Yeah. Now, David's got a question for you. I, it, I was just wondering, for someone that says uh, you're not sure if you've ever had a paranormal experience, why did you choose to become so educated in that area and publish in that area? I think it was just I found the, the subject fascinating. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I must admit that one of the things, it wasn't purely intellectual, it, it, there was a sense of excitement to it. it it's, there is something interesting, fascinating at an emotional level, mm. as well as the intellectual level. And I'd be dishonest if I didn't admit that. Um, so, th so that's really it. And, and even though, as you say, I didn't have clear cut paranormal experiences of my own um, from my you know, reading and inquiries and so on. It, 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 I believe that other people did have these experiences and these things do happen. In fact, when you talk to people who've had the experiences, just the degree of distress they sometimes experience in connection with them convince, can itself be quite convincing that they've had a, they're not, they're not really making it up, you know, that they, they have been traumatized perhaps by what's happened to them. Well, I'm in, I'm in a similar frame of mind where I've, I've, I've never had a real major viral class as a paranormal experience. Uh, but the subject does fascinate me and you have to uh, give credit to those that have had paranormal experience especially when they're close to you yes uh, you have to remain open-minded and that's where that's the same place I'm in if you like yes um just to give you a let you know about David um he's um been researching a story about the Gorse Hall murder in Staley Bridge I don't know whether you've heard of it no, I don't. I haven't it, heard of that. No, it happened in 1909, and nobody really knows who killed George Harry Stores. Now, yes. um, we went up there on um, Friday um, after a, a visit on there on Wednesday. One thing that um, we did have happen um, that we was going to tell everyone about afterwards, we went up. Me and Steve went up with David on during the day on the 31st, and my husband Steve here. He fa uh, saw somebody walking towards us, towards the actual foundations of the building. And then he disappeared, correct, Steve? Correct. And uh, he explained to David what the van looked like, um, trench coat and all that lot, wasn't it? Yeah. And when we went to up to do the investigation on the evening of the murder, at the exact time and everything, one of the guests that was with us thought that Steve was in the same in the area coming towards the um, foundations of the Gorse Hall. Um, but in fact, he was on the other side of the foundations talking to David here. And right. it wasn't until he realised that it wasn't Steve when he went to take a picture, the, 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 um, the apparition, which is the only word I can say for it, disappeared. I told him, when he came over to tell me, I said, hold on a minute. I brought him over to Steve and David and I said to um, Gary, tell them exactly what you was going to say because I stopped him mid-speech and he had actually explained exactly what he'd seen which was exactly what Steve had seen two days prior during the day. Right. Down to the trench coat and everything. Do you ha what, what would you think about that? Well, that's, that's very interesting. Is this uh, is the the property where the man was murdered? It, is it it's reputedly haunted? Is it? Is that that's how you Gary, came to uh, be well, doing? The, the entire area, uh, the Gorse Hall area, has a history going back uh, to the year twelve hundred, uh, and it it's always a very atmospheric place. Anyway, uh, the murder itself has just captured the the imaginations of pe people. Nationwide, really. We explained before that uh, Julian Fellows investigates and uh, Edward Woodward in suspicious circumstances. They covered it for TV and nobody has ever solved the murder of George Harry Stores. So we opened it up again uh, and we had a few interesting things happen. As you say, two people witnessing the same person over two days. Uh, and some of the names that were brought up on the night that actually matched in. Uh, and it was a very interesting, very interesting investigation. And is it, is it continuing? Are you going, planning to go back and do it more? It is. Or? I would love to yeah. go back and do more. What we're doing right now is we're in the process of trying to make digital copies of all the witness statements, etc., and any photographs that we have of the area in the time and turn it into an online museum. Uh, we're going to open it up to the public and 
see who they think killed George Harry Stores, but would love to go back up with the paranormal team again at another time. Yes. Uh, and see if we can uncover anything else and see if we can uncover anything that was similar to what we experienced that night. It's funny with this sort of uh, investigative activity, it can sometimes, you, you can have embarrassing experiences. At least it happened to me once. I was, um, again, in the book, I've written a chapter about some alleged phenomena up near Inverness, mm. including sightings of a sort of phantom battle. Now, I went up, this is an area of, sort of moorland and lochs and that sort of thing. It's a rural area just outside Inverness. And I went there, I've been there a few times, but one night I went up there with a, with, with a person, another person, and we were hoping to sort of stake out the area overnight. But at that time, um, a new water treatment works was, had been constructed or was under construction uh, near, what, near this particular loch, Loch Ashy. And we wanted to go near this area, but there was a sign at the end of a road saying keep out or something to that effect. And my companion suggested that we should go along. There's obviously a security presence there. We could see lights, go along and just say what we were doing. And, but I thought, no, if we go down that road, if they see torches or something, they'll probably call the police. But, but then, well, we'd driven a long way to go there. So I thought, okay, we'll give it a try. So we start down the road, but then we did come to a sort of keep out sign. Actually, I, the keep out sign was a bit further down the road. But by then it was too late. I think the security people or person had seen some suspicious activity, probably from his point of view or their point of view. And within about 10 minutes, the police arrived. So this was the middle of the night in the countryside outside Inverness. And I was, here was I as a clinical, I was working as a psychologist in those days, having to explain what I was doing up, getting up to. And uh, they, they sort of checked on us, you know, took our names and obviously yeah. rang through to the station to make sure that we weren't, you know, crooks or something. Mm -hmm. It may be that in places like that, in the countryside, if the suspicious activity, people might think it's a poacher or yeah. someone up to no good. Um, so it's, it's, a, it, you know, potential embarrassments with, with this sort of investigation. Yeah, but as I say, it's quite weird that, um, you know, that it was they disappeared and all sat in the other and, and two, two independent people on two independent times yes. um, actually saw the same thing down you know and, and what they look like so it was it was quite interesting it was one of the best things we got on the night basically the fact that it was collaborated by two days prior was there any sensation of fear associated with experience or was it was it just puzzlement it, it was just puzzlement um uh, as i say uh, gary thought that steve was over in the area and he was about to take a picture and um then he, he realized after a while, there was nobody there, so you yes. know, he thought he was coming towards him, um, sort of like, I don't know, about 20, 30 foot away, coming up towards the, uh, you know, if that, and um, and then he, he looked over and thought, well, that's not Steve, and then it, it disappeared. Yes. You know, so, because it was dark anyway, but it wasn't anybody actually coming up, um, there was nobody there at all, so yeah. um, nobody actually finished coming up the path sort of thing. Um so that was really interesting. And, and as I say, during the day, I think we met at 1 o'clock, didn't we, um, on Wednesday? We did, yeah. Yeah, 1 o'clock on Wednesday uh, in the afternoon. So um, we were up there, and it was about half past one, quarter to two, that um, I think was about like, around the time that you actually saw it, wasn't it, Steve? About half past one, quarter to two on Wednesday. Yeah. So, yeah, about you know, that. so it was, um, as I say, two different times. Um it was just before the 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 killing um, commemorative bit that uh, Gary had seen. We'd only just got up there on the evening, you know, so it was about quarter to nine, I think. So yes, you know, it was it was quite interesting the fact that two people had got similar stuff. Very very interesting, yes. But uh, speaking of Glasgow and um, and Scotland. Um, we have a theory, and perhaps you can maybe put your um, opinion on this. We get a lot of people that say, why don't we see cavemen and stuff like that? And we have this, me personally, I've got this theory that maybe it's like the stone tape theory. The tapes run out with um, the Loch Ness Monster, for instance. Um, yes. People were seeing it for a while, blah, 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 but there's not many sightings now. So do you think that could be um, a theory that... Uh, could pass it, it could well be as you say some of these old sort of some hauntings do seem mm. to run their course don't yeah. they they 
I mean, they may actually go on a long time, but then they just fizzle out, um, which could, as you say, be some sort of recording. Um, another possibility, again, from this sort of trickster, uh, d d dramatic production thing, it may be that the it's a bit like running a, sh a series of shows, and then the trickster decides to move on and try yeah. a different performance somewhere else. Yeah, this is um, it's it's it, it, it's yes. I think it, this the trouble is with this subject. It's it's ongoing. And at the moment, there don't seem to be a conclusion. Yes. That's well, I'm I'm actually quite pessimistic that we are really that we're going to get a conclusion. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, for instance, imagine that the the government today cancelled the defence budget. Yeah. And, and transferred every single pound into psychical research and ufology and so yeah. on. It gave. I think what you'd get is you get a mushrooming of people with PhDs in parapsychology and ufology and related things. You'd have a whole new institution of lecturers and researcher students and all this sort of thing. Some people would profit from that, of course, yeah. and they'd get they'd get status from it. But my my guess is, I mean, this maybe I'm being over pessimistic here. Is at the end of the day, there'd be very little to show for it, you know, in terms. And it's not because the paranormal, in a sense, doesn't exist. No. But I think it might be in the nature of the very phenomenon mm. that it doesn't want to reveal itself. It wants to keep itself sort of on the edge. It wants to. It, well, in in fact, it may even want to dole out big lumps of frustration, um, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and and not not give us the ultimate uh, the ultimate satisfaction of understanding it fully. Yeah. I, I think some of what we were talking about before about the anim animosity of uh, skeptics and cynics would also put a lot of people off reporting any sightings anyway. So yes. maybe there are a lot of everyday people that see things that they couldn't explain but don't bother to report them because of the animosity yes. that could be aimed towards them. Well, it's interesting you should say that because I, I've, I've been, it's been screened up here in Scotland, perhaps in England as well, a, a, a three-part series on Bigfoot. And uh, basically, it's be presented by a vet, and there's a scientist, a, a geneticist from Oxford University called Brian Sykes, who's a sort of leading geneticist, and he's received samples of ostensible Bigfoot or the equivalent from Asia, animal, you know, hair, bits of maybe his blood, and, and subjected them to top-notch uh, genetic analysis. And I haven't seen the third program yet, I've recorded it tonight, but of uh, taking the second one, which was about North America, uh, a few witnesses were interviewed who thought that they pretty convinced they'd obtained samples of, of hair and so on. And yet, when the analysis was done, that it all turned out to have a prosaic explanation, black bear or you know, canines or something like that. Now, at one point in the program, the presenter, the, the vet, said there are as many theories about Sasquatch as there are sightings or some words to that effect. But after these laboratory results came back, he seemed to immediately alight on the idea that the witnesses were, you know, having kind of misperceptions or even, you know, perhaps even hallucinations. I don't think he went that quite that far, based on a will to believe. Now, to my mind, that was a ridiculously narrow way of looking at it. I mean, it was suddenly earlier he'd said there were lots of theories, and now he's immediately assuming just because the, the biological evidence doesn't confirm that these samples show a, an unusual species, that the, the witness testimony must somehow be invalid. And to be fair to the presenter, it may be that he was just working from a script, and he, he had written the script. He was just the front man for the program. But it, it seemed a, a rather dismissive attitude. And from my perspective, I, I, I could imagine a situation like this, that, that there, could, there may not be any physical Bigfoot, but there can still be genuinely paranormal Bigfoot manifestations. Yeah. And therefore, if you do get a bit of hair, it won't be actually, it won't show itself to be an unusual species. But the actual original experience that the person had might very well have been a genuinely paranormal experience. Um, as I say, if we think of this sort of idea of a trickster playing playing games with us, um, it may relish that sort of thing. It can cause confusion, dissension, um, and it's unfortunate that the witnesses should be maybe dismissed so casually. 
And it, it would, as you imply or, or, or say explicitly, that it could put other people off coming forward. If you watch that program and you've seen a Bigfoot today, are you going to report that and get that treatment? Perhaps not. You might think it's better to have a quiet life and not have derision from colleagues and friends. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, hopefully, it's been a great discussion with you, Peter, and hopefully we can have you on again, maybe talking about your other subjects like paranormal amnesia. Right. Or even mysterious, um, uh, the uh, mysterious spatial displacement. Or spatial, right. If that's okay, sometime in C 2014. Certainly, yes. Thank you very much. That would be great. Now, let me just remind everybody, um, do you have a website by any chance? I don't actually know. No. Right, okay. But you can uh, get your book at Amazon.co.uk uh, yes. and also authorhouse.co.uk and uh, can you just uh, tell us again what your book is called yes it's called zones of strangeness and the subtitle is an examination of paranormal and ufo hotspots i added it to my wish list about 10 minutes ago did you <laughs> god so that's two buyers already and that's just for listening live so uh, hopefully um you'll have more but it's been brilliant having you on the show peter thank you for contacting us Thank you very much. You know, um, it's been. And can you tell us again where you found us? Um, I, I, I was just doing a, a, a web search on a, an internet search on, on paranormal-related radio shows. Oh, right. In fact, I thought you were in the United States. Right. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't realize. I don't think your website says where you're based, and I, I assumed that you were. You were. You were. You're on the uh, in the United States. No, it's, it's just at ktpf.co.uk. That's all. So. Ah, right. I should have perhaps <laughs> noticed that, yes. <laughs> That's okay. But, um, but yeah, I will put on it where we're based. That might help people. But, um, uh, as I say, um, do, and you know what KTPF stands for? I do now. I looked again tonight, yes. Keeping the, the paranormal friendly. I like that. Yeah, well, it needs to be done, I think. So, it does. Uh, you it know. does. But, uh, as I get said, thank you very much, Peter. It's been very nice. Please, if you've got any articles or um, anything coming up, books, let us know and we'll be happy to let everybody know about it. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, and uh, until next time, good night and God bless. Thank you very much. Nice Bye. to meet you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. What a wonderful man. What a wonderful, in um, interesting in interview. You enjoyed it. Very you, totally, yes. You know, so, you know, it's, um, it's been great. Um, uh, we've had, uh, okay, a bit of everything tonight. Um, so I'm just saying thank you again, as I normally do. Um, but uh, but yeah, and Andy, you bought the book. Come on! <laughs> what did he call himself? Um, and that's from someone who's a KTPF resident skeptic. <laughs> but uh, oh dear, you enjoyed it, didn't you? So so that was great. Now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you know about the um, uh, the events that are coming up. Okay, before we go back to uh, tell you a bit more about Gorms Hall, so bear with us, okay? So uh, we'll um, just play this. Fed up of wading through the activities and events that other advertisers include? Find just what you're looking for at paranormaleventsforyou.com, your one-stop paranormal directory. Yeah, well, uh, coming up in the next few weeks, uh, Tony Stockwell's still on tour. And uh, I'm not sure whereabouts he is this week, but um, if you'd like to check out his website, um, that's uh, let me just put that on the website for you um, and let you know where it is. But um, if you check his website out, you should be able to find out where he is. But he's going all over the, the uh, country. That's TonyStockwell.com. Okay, so that's uh, that one. And uh, then we've also got, um, on the 30th of November, Morecambe Winter Gardens. That's with UK Shadow Seekers. That's us. And um, and on the 14th of December, we've, uh, we're at Sheffield Town Hall. So if you'd like to go to uh, our website at ukshadowseekers.co.uk. Um, Sinai House are doing their own ghost hunting experiences. Um, you can uh, find out more about that um, at, let me see where we are, uh, oh they're being done by Spirit Watch Paranormal so um, uh, they're, they're doing that at Sinai House and Sinai House is in Burton on Trent so I'll just put their website there for you to have a look at and um, 
That's at spiritwatch dot uh, spiritwatchparanormal.co.uk. And um, who else is there? And there's also the all new Bluebell Hill Ghost Walks, which is really going well down there in Chatham in Kent, uh, which is being run by um, Neil Arnold. So uh, have a look at that. And they're being run up until December 31st. And uh, you can find out more about that by calling uh, Neil on 0785 or emailing him at neil.arnold at live.com. And we'll be having Neil on the show very shortly um, in the next coming weeks. Hopefully, Touchwood BT helps helps out. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we'll be talking to him about his black cats and Bluebell Hill and all sorts of things that he's done. And uh, if you want to go on any of our investigations, that's ukshadowseekers.co.uk. Um, so uh, hopefully... We'll uh, see some of you about telling us what you've been up to on your investigations. And uh, we want to know, you know, so uh, if you've got anything coming up, um, give us a call and, or just send it in and tell us what you thought of your investigation. Okay, so um, <coughs> that's it. So check out the One Stop Paranormal Directory for more investigations and events available now. ParanormalEventsForYou.com also offers banner advertising for only £10 per year. See our website for more details. ParanormalEventsForYou.com, your one-stop paranormal directory. Yeah, and if you are a, uh, a paranormal group and want to uh, do that for £10 per year, uh, just to let you know that that goes towards paying our server. Okay, and um, that's what the money's for, just to keep the, the uh, server online. And uh, that covers for all of our uh, websites, KTPF and uh, Trifield Paranormal Network and also ParanormalEventsForYou.com. So that's where the money goes to. So if, uh, if you're uh, interested in doing that, it will keep us online. Okay, and uh, anyway, we're going to go back to our original story. Um, which isn't actually a story, it's a bit of a uh, interest, to be honest with you. An yeah, an ongoing investigation. <laughs> yeah, so... Oh, hold well on then, hold well on now. Try again. Well, well, thank, well, thank you. <laughs> I don't know, you can't get the staff these days. No, you can't. Now, we're going back to... The, what, what is con what, we are considering an ongoing investigation. Yes. Uh, Obviously, uh, David said that he'd like to go back and have another go. Definitely, yeah. And uh, we've actually consulted with a couple members of the team, and they'd like to go back as well. Yes, Fantastic. definitely. Just call me, yes. and I'll be there. So we are. Let me call you. You'll be there. <laughs> yeah, after you dream, just call me, and I'll be there. Can I just say that um, uh, when we was walking down um, after the investigation on the night of um, the first of November, or rather the morning of the second of November. Uh, Dave just happened to say that um, uh, if we ever wanted a historian or a location researcher, um, please feel free to give us a ring. And I said, we are actually looking for one, so do you want the job? And so technically, he is part of the team now. And I thank you. Yeah, it <laughs> was, um, it's something that I've always wanted to do. I've been very similar to your last guest, actually. Yes. Whereas... I have a, a, a big interest in the paranormal, although mm. I've not experienced anything for myself. Well, no, this is it. And I'm a bit of a news hound. Mm -hmm. I like old places, and I like finding out about things. Mm. So if I can do that and help you guys out as well. That'd be great. I would love to. Good. Now, going back to last week. Now, we went up on Wednesday. Let's start with we Wednesday. You contacted us, didn't you? And, it, yes. and the plan was... Because we, uh, we, just to recap, people said, has there ever been a paranormal investigation? Yes. And you found us? Yes. Okay. Uh, I couldn't find details of any paranormal investigation. As it turns out, after I spoke to you, I did quite yeah. a few years ago, but nothing really significant was captured. No. Apart from an area they call the Bowling Green, which we didn't go up to. No. Because uh, we didn't have any real need. It has no significance to the ghost or murder story. No. <coughs> Excuse me. The specific story that we were, or that I was interested in for Staley Bridge Town, uh, was the ghost or murder. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's why I came to you to say, could you come help us out? Yeah, okay. Hence, 
What's going on there? Right, so Thursday, uh, sorry, Wednesday we met up, one o'clock. Yes. To take that ten minute walk. Yes, I did up. say ten minutes, didn't I? Yeah, it was about fifteen. <laughs> 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 Do you know what? My legs were killing me by the time I finished. Um, but anyway, but uh, we went up there and uh, we found the foundations. And yes. um, obviously you didn't tell us too much about what went on. I tried to tell you as little as possible. Yes. So um, we do. Th- we knew about Gorse Hall. We'd heard of it. We didn't know much about it, did we, uh, Steve? I didn't know nothing about the murder. I knew it existed. Yeah. And that was about it. Yeah. So basically it was all new to us. And we did say to you, don't tell us yeah. anything. Not being from the area. Yeah. Well, this is it. Not being from the area. But it was a place that we've been in- interested in, isn't it, Steve? We was thinking of going up there once and doing yeah, it outside. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, we went up there and we got up there... Roughly about twenty past half past one. Yeah, yeah, leisure and, and so and while we were there looking at the foundations and everything, Steve had Steve ran off. Yeah, oh, he ran, did. oh did he run yeah, off? He, Go on then, you we, tell uh, us. we were actually stood near the site of the kitchen. Yeah. Uh and we were having what I thought was a nice conversation hmm. until he ran off towards the stables. Right. Uh and when he was coming back is when he told me He'd seen something in that direction and right. he described to me yeah. uh, a man in a long trench coat, raincoat style uh, coat mm. and a hat. And the dress that he described would have fitted in with the Victorian period yeah. we're talking mm. about. Right. Which yeah. was interesting and, itself. And, and that thing about the hat was the only difference between me and me and Gary. Gary, it thought, was. Gary thought he was wearing a hood. Yeah. Well, he did say a, a hooded style hat. I think he did mention right. that. I'm not yeah. sure. Right. Uh, but the description, when we went up there on Friday, I was talking to Steve and then looked up and saw you running towards me with Gary. Yeah. Uh, and Gary described exactly the same person. I wasn't running, by the way. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, yeah right. Ga- Gary yeah. described exactly the same person. But you noticed so. him looking over there, though, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. And I, I had my eye on him for quite a while. Yeah. Because while I was talking to Steve, mm. I noticed his fascination in that direction. Because yeah. I was trying to keep an eye on everybody that was there. I wanted to be a part of everything that was going yeah. on. Um, so, yeah, I saw him going in that direction. And I, I shouted to him at one point, if you don't stop, you're going to fall. Yeah. Because the sight of the old hall was yeah. directly in front of where he was walking. Mm. Uh, and it wasn't really possible to see anyone walking up to us in that direction because of the layout of the land. Now, the bit that gets me is we were there on Wednesday. It was about quarter to two. It wasn't a bad day, was it? It wasn't raining. I'm sure it wasn't raining. No, no, no it was quite... During the day, it wasn't, no. No. It was damp, but yeah. the rain seemed to... The one thing that I did notice is the rain stopped Yeah. for us to go up on Wednesday, yeah. and then we had blue skies on Saturday Yeah. for the murder walk. Then it threw it down all the time yeah. before and after. Yeah. So. And then when we went up on the Friday, even for, even Friday night, the rain stayed off, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it did. It, 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 it was, was a, slightly misty. It was very it? damp, well, very yeah. misty. It was but damp and misty. But it no wasn't rain. Foggy, foggy, was it? No, no, no. It's no. not like you couldn't see twenty no. yards in front of you. Or no. anything. It was just there was a noticeable little yeah. eerie mist in the air, if you like. Yeah. Now we can obviously put that down to the fact that. Um, the mist was caused by the rain that we had yes. and blah, blah, blah. So the yes. atmospheric conditions. Yes. But um, we we obviously did a seance yes. trying to get some sort of um, reaction as such or, or some sort of confirmation round about the time of the murder. Yes. And you had a problem with your neck. I did. Uh, where I was stood in the circle with my my back to the pathway leading mm. up to the front entrance to Gorse Hall, uh, I, I initially kept having a sense that there was somebody behind me. Mm. And you'll notice me looking around yeah. quite a lot at that time. Yeah. And then I had quite a painful neck. Now, I have had neck trouble recently, but it hadn't bothered me for no quite a while. And for, for it to come in the way it did... It, it was quite uncomfortable. Yeah. We then turned the circle. We yeah. did. That's what can, I was just going to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, can I just say that Andy was also having neck problems that night? Well, that's yeah. the thing. When we turned the circle, I, I can't remember the lady's name that was Lynn. with us. Is it Lynn? Yeah. Lynn was stood where I was originally stood. Yeah. And then she started complaining of the same kind of pain that I was having. Yeah. So 
that was quite strange. And whilst itself. we was in the original position, I had a pain just down my right shoulder, which was next to you. Yes. Enough. Now, um, when we turned the circle, we had an obelisk type object, in, you know, a gadget as mon- amongst the K twos and what have you. Yeah. And we've been getting some words from there, and funny enough. It said next. It did. It did. Well, I've actually got, I've been sent the transcripts of all yeah. the words that were brought up that night. And the first one was neck. Neck. And that was, uh, that was weird. 20 to 10 in the evening, I think that yeah. was. Uh, but yeah, I was sent that today. Yeah. So, which was quite interesting. Very um, interesting. You know, there was a lot of obviously, interesting things Obviously, some night. of the words that came out wasn't connected. No, uh, I have delved into a few of the things that came from it, but right. not found anything else so far. But the investigation continues. And then we had continues. that EMF, um, EMF, um, yeah, the K two and the the, the K two went off in, in the stable, and and the it? guys meter yeah, in the, the stable area. Yeah, that was when we were stood in the courtyard. Yeah, no, we had no phones or anything like that. Nothing that would have affected it, you know. Um, that was quite interesting. It was because it was such an intense. Yeah shot of energy if it you was like going up to red and what have you uh maybe we touched on something while we were there maybe. that we didn't pick yeah. up on now of what we picked up on the night is there anything you can collaborate of what we picked up what i can collaborate is um steve actually mentioned when we were stood in the grounds that the he had a very strong feeling that the assailant escaped in a certain direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, it turns out after the night, you completely right. He did escape in the exact part of the house where you were stood. Um, he escaped right. through the pantry window. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he went after that, nobody knows. Mm-hmm. There. I mean, from from what I was getting, he went down the hill where we saw that figure coming up. There that, that is way. with. with the that escape route, we, they even had bloodhounds come up the next day mm. and couldn't pick up the scent. Uh, and one of the things the police were looking for was the murder weapon. And that has still never been found. So the knife that actually killed George Harry Stores was never found. Right, okay. Um, and yeah, like say in the stables where we picked up on, one thing we haven't said about the, the story is that George Harry Stores had a coachman who lived on the grounds in the stables uh, and he hung himself a week after George's murder. It was nothing to do with guilt. He was in a pub called the Grosvenor at the time of the murder uh, and attended with the police afterwards. Uh, it, it, it was, well, it may have been out of guilt. It may have been out of guilt that he wasn't there to protect Harry, but he certainly wasn't the murderer. And in the stable area where the activity on the EMF meter was, uh, that was close to the location yeah. that... James Worrell, the coachman, actually killed himself. So, yeah, there, w- there was a lot of interesting things that went on there. Yeah, and also um, we picked up on Eliza, which... You did, and I can confirm now that Eliza was the name of the cook. Okay. Uh, she worked for George Harry Stores for quite a while. Right. She was called Elizabeth, but it was shortened to Eliza. Yeah, because I said household. Elizabeth, didn't I? You first? did, yeah. you did, with it, within the first... Yeah, that was on the first, uh, on the Wednesday. It was, yeah. yes. And um, what else was there? There were some others, wasn't there? Margaret. When, when, when we came up, when we approached the house, you mm. said that you could hear somebody shouting quite sternly, Margaret, yes. Margaret. Yeah. Well, Margaret would have been Maggie Stores, which was George right. Harry Stores' wife. Okay. Uh, and they married in 1891. Uh, George was 31 at the time, which was quite late in life. Uh, they believe... It wasn't really a marriage of love, it was more yeah. convenience, and 31 was very late in life to get married mm. at that particular period of time. Well, well in that period of t- in time, you wouldn't, wouldn't expect to live much more than about 50, would you? Yeah, the life expectancy is short. Well, well shorter in George Harry's case in the yeah. end, but uh, yes, the life expectancy was very short. Has there been any stipulation on the Elwood, perhaps? I haven't found any reference right. to Elwood yet, oh, okay, okay. but I am still looking. Right. What what? I haven't had much chance to do more research because, as you know, we were up there till about two o'clock Saturday morning. Yeah, and, then and Saturday. then Saturday during the day, I was up there yeah. again with some members of the public doing the Gorse Hall murder walk. Yeah, with the friends of Gorse Hall, 
uh, telling the story of the murder, and we also put on ex an exhibition of yeah. some of the witness statements from the night. Right, we're looking forward to seeing them. Well, we are going to put them all online over this next couple of weeks. That'd be great. So I will make sure that you get to see them. Right, okay, and we'll let everybody know what the website is, so or where you're going to put them. Certainly, well, I'm from stalybridgetown.com, yep. and they will be on there. They will be on there. we do have a very lively Facebook page, so right. if you want to check us out, then look for Stalybridge Town on Facebook. That's great. And and Gorse Hall is quite famous, obviously. It's everywhere online, really, isn't it? It George is. Harry's it is. With the, with the unsolved murder and the links to Beatrix Potter, yeah. uh, it's a place of history, but mm. it's also a place of beauty. And can I just say, if anybody does go up there on the back of what we've been talking about tonight to have a look around them, please keep it tidy. Please keep yeah. it safe. Please keep your dogs on a lead. Please clean up after the dogs. It's a 35-acre site, and it's looked after voluntarily by the Friends of Gorse Hall. They do a good job. It is. And if anybody has any information on the Gorse Hall murder, because uh, the families and the descendants of the people involved some are still alive. We know they're dotted around Manchester. We yeah. know they're in Blackpool. We know there's some on the south coast. Uh, some emigrated. Uh, and we don't actually have any photographs at all from inside the house itself. No. So if anyone can uncover anything from inside Gorse Hall, we'd love to see it. Now, if there's any paranormal enthusiasts that want to go up there themselves to have a look. Yes. Who is it best that they speak to? Uh, it is best they either get in touch with us at Staley Bridge Town so that we can put them on to the right people or get in contact with the Friends of Gorse Hall directly themselves yeah, even though who it are responsible for the lease of the yeah, land. It is, as I say, even though it's a public park. It is still classed as... Uh, it, it, it is there for the public. It was yeah. stipulated by Maggie Stores that it had to remain green yeah. land after it was passed down. The land itself is owned by Tameside Council right. and leased by the Friends of Gorse Hall. So you need so permission. There is still, you still need permission to do anything major up there. Right. Uh, you can't just go and set up. That's fine. So, so you, you've heard it here. You can't just go and set up. You really need to get some, comp, you know, some uh, permission so that people know that you are actually up there. But anyone that's interested in doing an investigation, let us know because mm. we're interested too. Well, so. this is it. Yeah. You know. did, did, the, uh, did the Friends know anything about, anything about letters? I have mentioned it to them, mm -hmm. and I am meeting with the friends of Gorse Hall this week to go through a lot of the findings and a lot of the questions, and I have mentioned about the letters, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, so I, I will come back to you at a later date. On that. Right, so uh, there you go, guys. That's what happened on Friday night, um, an ongoing um, situation that we're doing, an ongoing investigation, not just paranormally, but also scientifically when it comes to your own research, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's something that's fascinated me for 30 years now. Mm. Being, I'm from Staley Bridge. Staley Bridge, born and bred. Yeah. I keep trying to move away, but never get away. So. Uh, well, there you have it. And um, we, we enjoyed ourselves, and thank you for choosing us. Thank you for coming. So, Seriously, thank you. So uh, we will keep you informed um, somehow by your form. Uh, it will be on Staley Bridge Town if we get any more that we find. And if you do want to go up there and do it yourself, like I say, get permission first. But saying that, if you do find anything, please let us know as well as uh, Staley Bridge Town because we can um, put it all together and we can collate, uh, collate this is it. The entire stuff. idea. This is yeah. the, the whole point to this things. is to collate everything yeah. and put it all out there yeah. so that future generations. Well, this can is it. Study it, and we can compare results and, and you, stuff like that. You never know. We've all got these different bits. One day, somebody can go, "Yes, he did it." Yes, it you never know. For. But then that would spoil it. It would. <laughs> Maybe it would. <laughs> it would spoil the mystery yeah. if we found out. But it, it. but it would still only be one person. Just that opinion, curiosity. Yeah. How many people were suspected of the murder? Uh, it could be any number, really. Pro possibly f four. Right, Maybe. So James but Worrell I, James, killed himself. James Worrell was George Harry's coachman. And under no way was he a suspect of the actual murder because he was in a pub called the Grosvenor in Staley Bridge at the time. Although he I came feel... Up with the police. But yeah. there was talk, and still is talk, of a conspiracy. Mm. Uh, the possibility of blackmail has been brought up very yeah. recently. Uh, so, and the actions of some of the family members on the night of the murder and the weeks following it. Mm. 
were a bit uh, suspicious, uh, to say the yeah, least. Definitely yeah, definitely uh, There was an argument on the day of George Harry's funeral between James Storrs, who was not to be mixed up with James Well, uh, who was George's brother, and Maggie Storrs, who was George's wife, mm. over who got the control and share of the company because right. it was in Maggie's name and she refused to sell it to James. Okay. And James Worrell, obviously, um, even though not connected with the murder, he did kill himself over guilt. And I feel, really, that he knew something and that's why... It is a possibility. Yeah. I, I mean, from what I picked up, I, I think he saw somebody on the ground the day before and didn't say anything. But, uh, and you say, when, the, when, when you first rang us up, the first thing I got was brother. So, yes, so you, said that, you said that on the Wednesday. Yeah, naturally, so I asked him if George had a brother. Yeah. It turns out he did. He had two. But also, there were two other brothers, wasn't there, that weren't his, but uh, connected to another young lady who, uh, who, there was who Marie, could possibly so, have been there at the time. Now, you see, this is where we're going down the path of Julian Fellows, whereas he investigated the connection with a lady called Maria Hall, H-O-H-L, who was a friend of a guy called Inns, who was George Harry Storrs' solicitor. Mm. Now, there, George Harry was seen walking with Maria Hall in Stamford Park on a few occasions, therefore triggering rumours uh, that they were having an affair. She disappeared for eight months and then came back, and about four or five years before the murder, she killed herself in Staley Bridge. She threw herself in the canal. Uh, now, there was talk that she was pregnant, and the reason we brought in the other brothers was on the day of the murder, there were reports of two foreign gentlemen in the town, which was quite unusual, and she was from Switzerland, and now confirmed since. Mm -hmm. And her brothers were visitors to Staley Bridge, therefore, just that fact that there were foreign gentlemen in the town, unusual in that period mm -hmm. of time brings them up as a possible, possible suspect. But no corroborative link, of course. No, no. Uh, there's no uh, there's a, oh, When I mentioned that to Paul, uh, before I could get out, because all I said was they were foreign, and he said German. Right. So I, I don't know if that links... No, at all. I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't say either way. Right. Uh, Maria Hall was from Switzerland. Yeah. And that's where she came in. Whether her descendants were German, uh, I don't know. Okay. Well, um, I wish you all the best of luck with this. Thank you, and thank you again for coming that's down fine. and helping me with it. Um, you know, I'm I'm as intrigued, intrigued now than ever. You know, it's um, I've got that book downstairs. I'm gonna try and go have a look through that. Read it, but remember, it's subjective. It's subjective, yeah, no problem. But it it will give me a rough idea of what the hell is going on. You know, but then again, do I read it? Will it influence next investigations? Yes. We we are not. Let me just clarify this. Me and you are not mediums, are we, Steve? Uh, I don't class myself as a medium. No, way. but I, we are sensitive enough, and sometimes we do pick up stuff that. Hmm. You know, that does actually seem to be spot on, don't we? Yeah, I, I, I you mean, were spot on with a few things. I mean, the, the word medium, psychic, and all the rest of it is very subjective, really. Mm. Uh, you are what you are, you get what you get, and as long as you put out what you get, right or wrong, it's there to be done. Yeah. Exactly, it's all there to be investigated. Yeah. And you like the fact that there was, your, your quote was the fact that you like the like the idea about the senses and science. Yes. You, so, you, you have a good mix in the group mm. and it works well. I think that's what you Friday. need. Definitely. You know, Definitely. because I've always said you can be too sceptical, you can be too paranormal, you need to have that mix. Um, you know, you need to have, all right, there's gadgets out there that have been made not for this sort of thing, but some of them do work, don't they? And... Um, they do, indeed. you know, they have some sort of significance, and uh, if we can use them for this sort of thing and, and find out, you know, what's going on, technology is wonderful. We need yeah? to use. Yeah. So, but uh, but anyway, thanks again, David. Thank you, and uh, thanks for coming in and talking to us about Welcome, it. Welcome, pleasure. I you enjoyed know, every minute. Good and <laughs> good, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I say, um, you know, obviously, come back on the show again and and just. Be a guest and talk to whoever's on. Certainly, I've enjoyed it. Okay, so, well, thanks again. Um, 
Well, next up, next week, that's not going to play, but never mind. Um, next week, we hope to have Mark Rosney on the show uh, via Skype. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about um, uh, Shingle Hall and other hauntings that he's been to. So that should be interesting. I we'll get fed up with hearing about Shingle Hall because we can never go there, don't, can we, Steve? Uh, um, no, no, he won't let us in. John's just turned around and said, the neck pain you got that night could have been the coachman. I don't know. Well, considering he hung himself, it's very possibility. possibility. Very yeah. possibly, yeah. 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 It could have been. So... But um, uh, but why th- in that area? That's I don't know. Thing. I would have thought you would have got that more in in, in the stables. In, in the stables where, yeah. where we actually committed suicide. You never know. But obviously, spirit gets. You but then again, down. like we say, George St- George Harry Stores was stabbed fifteen times. He was. You know, and on that night, just to recap on ah, that, yes. he was supposed to have been shot, was he? Well, the uh, the assailant came in with a revolver. Yeah. Uh, but when the revolver was looked at after the crime. Uh, it was useless. It would never have fired. It had a rifle bullet jammed in the barrel. Yeah. Uh, it was a very amateur attempt. Right. And so then he ended up being stabbed. He was stabbed 15 times. Right. And you, you were saying earlier that Andy's helped you out with some information. He has, yes. Uh, through some genealogy websites and some studies him and his father have done, hmm. uh, he's put me onto a couple of things. Uh, I, I need to investigate George Harry's sister. A little bit, right? Which is a person that's only just come to light through things that Andy has forwarded to me. Okay. Uh, and yes, I have enjoyed the input and very, very much, and very yeah. much appreciated. Because April continues. was mentioned, wasn't it? One of the words. Yes, one of the words was April. So I don't know whether he was actually born in April. George was born on April the twentieth, eighteen sixty. Ah, we found that out. Yes, we? I found that out yesterday. I so, did, who told you that? Uh, I found it out with the help of Andy. Oh, right. Uh, it was listed as a 1861 at one point. Yeah. But Andy has found the records of the original birth certificate, even down to the reference number. Wow. And I checked it later on as well. And yeah, he, he's, he was born on, I think it was the 20th of April, 19, 1860. Wow, well, so that was more good information then. So April welcome. again. Yes. So, yeah, cool. so maybe we did reach George. Maybe, maybe, and maybe, maybe like we did. said, he doesn't want people to know who murdered him. As I said to you, I am meeting with the friends of Grass Hall again this week, and I've promised not to release too much of what was said. No, that's fine. Until I've spoken to them. Right, but we did have a theory that maybe no. he didn't want anyone to know. Yes, I don't think he did. Well, I, no. I, I think there is a possibility that George Harry Stores maybe felt like he deserved what he got. Yeah. Therefore, has never said to the. He had 45 minutes between yeah. the incident and him actually passing on yeah. to tell the police who actually murdered well, him. But right. he, he didn't take that opportunity. As, as a devil's advocate, because I'm not saying this is Carry true, on. but we did pick up on, on, on females being involved, uh, it could also have been that he did actually love his wife and it was his wife that did it. Yes, mm-hmm. the possibility. Possibility, yeah. yeah. Uh, did you happen to find out whether, whether he was face down, got stabbed in the back? I haven't yet. Right. And what I want to do is meet up with the friends. And find out. And go through yeah. the actual statements from the night. Well, right. as I say, you'll keep us posted. Definitely. And definitely let us know. Right. But on on the whole, what was your experience of the whole It was thing? fantastic. You know, and, uh, and you've learnt more. Definitely, yes. Um, I remain open-minded. Mm-hmm. Um, but we still look for the murderer of George Harry Stores. Right. So we'd love to do it again sometime. That would be great. Okay. Well, thanks again. Until next time, guys, I'm afraid that's it from us. And uh, uh, and David here, and I'm sure he'll be back on the show soon. And uh, we'll have to go now. Um, until next time, as I say, next week we've got uh, Mark Rosney, if all goes well, and the week after, The Cage. So uh, until next time... Um, Good night. Oh, Poppy, you're still there. I hope you've enjoyed it, my darling. Um, I hope you see speak to you next week. Uh, I hope it's been interesting for you. Um, and whoever else is left, we've got seven people left in the hub. Um, some of them we've actually normally get moaned at because we go home early. Or rather, we finish early, but we seem to have outdone them again. <laughs> but until next time, uh, oh, good night to uh, John. Savage um, and Anita. Uh, uh, they've, they've, uh, yep, they have gone, but uh, gone, uh, they might be hearing us, though. They might be. You know, and Andy's had to go as well because he's got, obviously yep. he's got school tomorrow. So, good night to uh, Ghost Rider, John, 
uh, in Norwich. And Tigger and all. And Tigger. Yep, you're there as well. So uh, thanks again for uh, staying on, and uh, we'll speak to you next week. Okay, good night and God bless. Yeah, and don't forget, guys, keep, keep the, the paranormal, paranormal friendly. friendly. Good night. To see in the night, to measure the spike, to see how cold it's been. I buy my kit so I won't forget the ghosties that I have seen. The Paranormal Intelligence Gathering Services Ghost Store. So visit www.the-pigs.co.uk forward slash ghost store.